Welcome everybody to this uh, ISTS organized course on Android malware analysis, or, but really the course is being delivered by uh, our friends from Google's Android security team. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome all of you and saying I'm B.S. Subramanian, I'm professor of computer science at Dartmouth and head of the Institute for Security, Technology and Society, which is organizing this event jointly with, with Google. Um, the course itself is going to last for three days. And because of you know, geographic constraints, uh, it's going to be starting at 12 noon Eastern. And every day it's around 7 p.m. Um, Eastern again. And um, the first day today is going to be an introduction to Android malware and trends. But tomorrow and day after, we're going to be looking at different specific techniques. What exactly are we looking at? Uh, here's a detailed agenda. This is a little different, uh, slightly different from what you've seen before, but um, it gives you an idea of the kinds of material we're going to cover. So Sebastian will kick things off uh, after I'm done today. And then JJ from Google. So all the speakers on the schedule are from Google except for this 3 p.m. slot on Friday, which is me telling you a little bit about Android malware research going on at Dartmouth. Uh, but other than that, uh, this is um, a show that's being run, has been organized and um, put together by our friends from Google. Uh, I'd like to make introductions to members of the Google team who will be presenting over the next three days. Not all of them may be here right now, but I'd, I'll start with Sebastian Forst, who's been my partner at Google in organizing this event. Sebastian um, has been a manager on the Android security team for many, many years, and he currently leads the Android malware research team. So he's basically one of the world's foremost experts on Android malware. Uh, also joining us will be JJ Arshad. You should be able to see everybody's picture uh, on, this, uh, on the files showing photographs. Uh, showing the camera feeds. And he's been a senior software security engineer at Google um, in their Android security and privacy team. And prior to this, he was at the International Security Systems Lab. Uh, so a lot of experience in um, um, Android security as well, as well as security in general. Alec Gurton, shown here, works on reverse engineering, again, on the Android security and privacy team. And his work is looking for malware, primarily looking for malware that comes pre-installed uh, on devices. Arthur Kaiser um, has been looking at all kinds of abusive behavior and unwanted software uh, that exists on uh, the Android platform. And um, <laughs> um, he's trying to figure out uh, who has put different kinds of ads on your phone. Vadim Kotov is a security engineer on Google's Android malware team, and he basically picks Android apps apart, looks at issues like obfuscation and de-obfuscation, unpacking uh, analysis program code. Uh, Roman uh, Unicek, uh, I've known Roman's work uh, for many years because he's the author of numerous Aspersky reports uh, on various kinds of Android malware. So uh, his um, I knew of him um, even before I started uh, working with Google. And he's a reverse engineer on the Android malware research team um, and looks at um, protecting Google Play from various kinds of malicious apps. Um, and he's looked at large botnets, large uh, advanced threats over many, many years. On an administrative note, um, this is a relatively small group. You can see we have about 22 participants right now. Uh, on an administrative note, I should say that the entire course is being recorded, and by saying you basically consent to that. Uh, I'd also request that everybody please mute their microphones. Because we're small, people can chime in and ask questions, but please mute your microphones uh, for other times. I want to also acknowledge Bill Nyson, the Deputy Director of the Institute for Security, Technology, and Society, who has been working with me uh, and Sebastian in organizing this. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna go through 
I'm going to call on each of you from Dartmouth to say, you know, two sentences about who you are and what you do. And I'm going to go through this in the order in which I see you on my screen. So if I call on you, please be prepared to please unmute your mic and say a couple of words. Uh, Andrew. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, as VF said, um, my name's Andrew Campbell. I'm a professor at Dartmouth College. I work in the area, research area of like mobile sensing. And when I was at Google, I was in the, worked in both the sort of Android sensing group under Mark Sagatis and also in Verily in their mental health, well, mental health sensing group um, at that time. So it's uh, fabulous to be here. Thank you for putting this together. I know it's a huge amount of effort and I wish I could spend the three days here, but unfortunately, uh, various of the meetings, are, sounding meetings I have to drop out to. But anyway, great to meet you all. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Sayak, you're up next. So I'm, I'm, I'm Shayak Chakraborty and I'm from India. I've completed my undergraduate in computer science and maths and my master's in maths. So, but due to the current visa issues, I'm looking forward to join the computer science department next year, like in March. Thank you, Sayak. Uh, Bill? I'm Bill Nice, and I'm the deputy director at the uh, ISTS. I work closely with VS, um, and it was really my pleasure to work with Google to put this together. Thanks again. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Jia Ling? Hello, everyone. I'm Jia Ling Wu. Um, I'm a CS master student here at Dartmouth, and I'm working with Andrew on the mobile sensing. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jia Ling. Uh, Saksham? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Saksham from New Delhi, India. I'm a uh, sophomore at Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth undergraduate school and I'm a prospective computer science major and I'm looking forward to working with Professor uh, Subramanian on uh, an Apple Android malware research project. Thank you, Saksham. Prashant? Uh, hey, I'm Prashant. I'm a PhD student uh, over here in my fourth year. And uh, I work with Sean Smith mostly on network security and some amount of operating, uh, operating systems. Um, this is primarily my first foray into Android apart from doing app development. So I'm really, really excited. Thanks, Prashant. Uh, Zdenek, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. No, no, you did a good job. Hi, I'm, I'm Zdenek, originally from Prague, Czech Republic. And I, I work at Dartmouth uh, as a microscopy specialist, quite remote from Android reverse engineering, but uh, I would like to kind of uh, get more into this user interface programming and stuff like that. And I'm taking this opportunity to uh, like have it as an as a intense uh, boot camp on Android programming and reverse engineering. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Zdenek. Uh, Chan? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chen, and currently I'm the final year computer science PhD student under the supervision of VS. And my research is about the Android malware uh, and analyze and characterization. Uh, we had collaboration be before with the Google Android security team, and I'm very happy to join here again. Thank you, Chen. Yan Hai. Hi everyone, I'm Yan Hai Xiong. Uh, I'm here working in Dartmouth as a postdoc with VS. Uh, we're working on uh, multiple projects, including some projects of uh, Android malware detection and analysis. I'm also working with Chen. Thank you, Yan Hai. Uh, Jack? Um, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Jack Sadoff. I'm an, uh, an undergraduate senior uh, at Dartmouth and I'm uh, about to uh, be begin my thesis on uh, generating Android malware. Thanks, Jack. Joshua? Hi, I'm Josh Ackerman. I'm a second year PhD student or beginning my second year. I'm working with both Sean Smith and George Zabanko to try to um, think about and uh, explore how formal methods can kind of pair with machine learning and probabilistic techniques to solve cybersecurity problems. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Yuji? Hi, everyone. I'm Yuji. I'm new postdoc in that mouse. What with uh, VS, uh, I'm trying to explore how to use Game City to improve the security. 
Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, Katie? Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a fourth year undergraduate um, and I'm in the QSS department, but I've been more interested in Android programming and I thought that this would be a really great bootcamp course to take. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Um, and let's see, I've got Roman, Jelling, or Arthur. I've got somebody, oh, Samid, how about you? Hi, um, I'm Samid. I am uh, uh, I'm a second year PhD student in the Trust Lab working with Dr. Sean Smith. Um, most of my research is concerned with secure verified parsing and um, also digging into like intraprocess memory isolation in weird machines. Um, I'm super interested in this course to see how weird machines are constructed in Android. Thank, Thank you. you. And Shayan? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shayan. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Dartmouth, and I'm working with Andrew Campbell on mobile sensing systems uh, to model humans' behavior. Fantastic. Thanks. I, did I miss anyone out from Dartmouth? I think I got everybody. Okay, great. So if not, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and turn it over, turn the floor over to uh, Sebastian, who's going to be getting us introduced to Android malware and trends in Android malware. And then the, all the technical, real technical, hard technical stuff will start after that. So Sebastian, all yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, VS, for the introduction. Uh, let me uh, share my screen, and then we're going to get right started. The uh, first presentation of this very long three-day session is going to be a very generic, non-technical um, session, which makes it a little bit different from the sessions that are going to be uh, thereafter. So I'm going to give you a little bit of upfront uh, information about what Android malware looks like, what trends we're seeing in Android malware, what we care about. I even introduce a little bit Android security as a whole. So it's more of a presentation style than the remaining sessions, which have a presentation style, but also a, a very much of a, of a hands-on component to it. If you have any questions, uh, please hold them till the end of this presentation. I, I ask you to do that because we're recording these sessions. And I think um, the recordings are going to have a nicer flow if um, the sessions are held at the end. So let's dive right in. I uh, want to show you the agenda first for this first session. I'm going to talk a little bit about Android security uh, in general, just introducing the concept and what's happening in the space. Um, it's gonna be very, very short. Um, and then we're gonna move on to what we call PHA, Moose and Google Play policy violations. If you've never heard of these terms, uh, stay tuned for the second section. And then I'll talk a little bit about Android malware trends as we have been observing them uh, on Google Play and also outside of Google Play. Starting with a brief overview of Android security. The mission of the Android security team is essentially that we want to protect every Android user. And there's a lot of Android users out there. Um, we have somewhere between two and a half billion and three billion Android devices uh, running in, in, in the hands of users, be it mobile phones, be it tablets, be it specialty devices. Um, Android TV, Android Auto, or even more abstract and uh, unexpected like smart locks, for example. We definitely have seen smart locks that use Android or other uh, IoT devices. So there's a lot of responsibility coming with securing the Android ecosystem. And the people that are here today and the next two days, we're mainly coming from the perspective of Android malware. Android malware detection, Android malware analysis, Android malware research. But that's only a very small part of the whole picture of Android security. There's many parts that need to work together to ensure that our users can use the devices without fear that they may be hacked or loss of data or phishing attacks and so on. So we're building a fairly strong framework from the bottom up hardware software layers and then i actually i like to call the the malware detection layer the last ditch effort to protect users because if you have a safe and secure system uh, that should already stop a lot of the uh, potential malware attacks and so 
malware, malware uh, detection analysis for me, really the last ditch effort to save a user. Everything else has failed. We are transparent in what we do. Um, we have a lot of blog posts as the Android security team, and um, we also have what's called the Android Transparency Report. Um, if you want to Google for that, I also have a link on that on the, on the last uh, slide where I have a couple of sources. Um, but yeah, on the Android Transparency Report, which is part of Google's Transparency Reports, we also talk a lot about numbers, about what we're seeing in the Android ecosystem. And we partner, of course, with a lot of teams. Um, there's not just a lot of teams inside Android security, but there's a lot of teams outside of Android security that we work with. Uh, Google's account protection team or um, the safe browsing team, which you may be more familiar with, with the uh, warnings about unsafe websites if you, if you use them in Chrome or Firefox. Um, we probably easily work with, I don't want to overstate it, but 30 to 50 teams um, outside of the Android security team in securing Android. Um, so it's a massive effort actually. The focus areas of the Android security organization is really a three part. The first one is the app safety engineering side. App safety engineering is uh, the part that all of the speakers of this week are part of. Uh, that's malware scanning, that's uh, malware analysis, malware research, uh, unwanted behavior analysis, uh, Google Play policy detection, anything that kind of deals with the security and privacy aspects of applications. Um, applications distributed through Google Play, applications it's, we have uh, obviously the hardware detection teams, the cryptography teams, um, and uh, trusted uh, execution environment teams and so on. There's a whole bunch of teams that try to make the hardware in case of pixel devices. And not just in case of pixel devices, we also we, we work with other partners to make um, our hardware and software improvements available to them and also just uh, changes to Android, the open source project, um, how to make that more resilient against attacks. The last big part is security assurance, which is uh, really um, how can we develop Android in a, in a secure way? Uh, if you've ever worked on uh, or heard of secure development life cycles. Um, that's kind of security assurance. How can we make sure that only safe code goes into Android in the first place? And if it turns out that there are unsafe pieces that need to be patched, how do we deal with managing the vulnerabilities? That's a daily, not a daily, the, the monthly updates to um, Android in the Android security bulletins, which describe all the security and privacy gaps that got patched every month. And how do we deploy that to other phones, be it Samsung or, or um, Xiaomi or whatever. So those are the three major components, app safety, platform safety, and um, just a continuous security assurance program. It's a very full slide. I just want to show a little bit about the improvements of the platform security side, um, because this is more or less the last time you're gonna hear about platform security and the uh, um, the last component about security updates and security patches as part of these three days of, uh, of workshops. It's really interesting when you look at it over time, the, at the beginning of Android, you, you had stuff that is uh, so extremely common nowadays, um, like Android, uh, address space, address space layout re randomization, ASLR, that even at the time when Android was first deployed, like uh, in 2000 and uh, don't let me lie, I think it's 2008-ish to 2010-ish. It was when the first versions were developed internally and publicly released and then Play Store was added. Even back then, ASLR was not actually uh, an exciting new technology. It just had to be uh, retrofitted uh, into, into the very early versions of, of Android. And then over time, the, uh, the security of the, of the platform, be it in the software side or on the hardware side, gets more and more and more esoteric, right? And for example, you add things that are strongly user-facing, like in, in Android 6.0, you have fingerprint APIs for like fingerprint um, login and uh, authentication of uh, you uh, being the owner of the device using it right now. You got things like SE Linux, which uh, were introduced in, in um, Android 5.0, which uh, really made a big, big contribution to stopping a lot of um, um, just privilege escalation uh, exploit attempts. And so then in Android 9.0, also a good user-facing example, people are more getting, are getting more and more 
concerned about being tracked wherever they go. So we now have a MAC address randomization. Um, and we have at one point, we also have a Bluetooth address randomization. So we just want to make it harder to track uh, or to get tracked as Android users. And we want to make sure that exploits and privilege escalation attempts are just not as uh, successful as they used to be. So a lot of new stuff is shipping, shipping all the time. And I, I made these uh, slides before Android 11 came out um, just about yesterday. And so I don't actually know what was announced for Android 11 in, in the first new security and privacy features. I'm sure there's a blog post somewhere. So if you're interested in that, just Google that. On the app safety side, we think of, um, we think of the attack surface as four different things. There's the system, which is mostly handled by the platform security team, not necessarily our own team. Uh, then there's the application side, which is uh, strongly handled by us. We care a lot about applications and the analysis of, of that. Um, there's the phishing side or other social engineering attacks, which are historically very difficult to prevent. Uh, there's a lot of companies in that space that are trying to, uh, to solve that problem of uh, phishing and other social engineering, not just on Android, but across the, the ecosystem on other, other um, platforms too. And that's the end user. Um, sometimes, despite all the protections that are in place, it's a challenge to, uh, to protect two and a half billion users about. And I think we've learned over time that giving users the ability to make their own security and privacy decisions may be okay if you have a niche operating system or niche product that serves um, the, uh, the hardcore technical elite user, or at least the folks that believe themselves to be that. But if you have a mass market product, um, I think it's very important to reduce the amount of decisions that uh, people make as much as possible because how can we expect that 2.5 billion users have the education and knowledge to make correct decisions about the, the security state of the device? We believe malware protection should be built into the OS. I think that's also a common trend. Uh, Windows has it with uh, Windows Defender. We have it with Google Play Protect and um, Chrome, uh, Chrome OS has it with um, all the safe browsing work that is going into uh, making uh, users just safer from being attacked over websites. That's the numbers we have. We uh, verify about 50 billion apps every day. Um, obviously, we don't scan 50 billion apps every day. There's not even that many apps out there. But that's how we, we do live on device checks, right? And so if you, if you tally that up, that's how you end up with the 50 billion numbers. Uh, we have more than 2 billion devices protected. I talked about 2.5 to 3 billion devices earlier. Not everybody actually opts into Google Play Protect. And many people, like hundreds of millions of people disable Google Play Protect. And so we only, only protect about uh, 2 billion devices, which to our knowledge is still the most widely deployed uh, um, malware scanner. We, we, we scan, we do actually scan in our backends about half a million to a million applications every day, which is a lot. Um, Outside of the usual suspects like, like YouTube or whatever, that just by the nature of the product, use a lot of storage and CPU power and whatever. We actually are, are surprisingly high up in the, in the chain of um, just storage and CPU consumption uh, as far as Google Teams go. Definitely we are, we are um, punching above, above our weight class there. Generally, and that's a slide or a screenshot of from the uh, Android transparency report. Generally, the uh, Google Play, Google Play kind of uh, stays fairly safe, extremely safe compared to site loading from like random websites or maybe less vetted third party stores. Um, depending on how you measure, it's about seven times to 20 times safer to use Google Play than it is to uh, just site load random applications. So I'll talk a little bit more about why that is later on. Um, don't interpret too much into the, the downward trend of outside of Google Play. The, the problem with outside of Google Play is really that there's an endless number of applications out there. And even we, with our resource and teams, we can't look at the whole thing. So we have a fairly high confidence that we look at every application in Google Play, which already is a challenge because, well, there's millions of applications in Google Play. 
but outside of Google Play, there's just so many applications, we can't look at all of them. And so the trend is kind of more like, it's, it's actually very correlated with how much we invest at any given time into looking at applications outside of Google Play, rather than the true, um, the true uh, badness rate, I would say. Just a quick intro. Let's move on to PHA Moose and Google Play policy violations. So what is that? Uh, for people who don't know, there's, it's essentially three categories of undesirable applications. PHA was originally the focus of our team when we started about 10 years ago. PHA stands for potentially harmful applications. In general, that's kind of what people, especially industry people consider malware. It's not exactly the same. I'll give you some examples. Um, one, one example is that we consider um, tools that you can use to root your device. We consider them PHA, right? Um, even though they're very, very desired by users that want to root their device for whatever reason. Um, but because we, we know that uh, if you root your device, you fundamentally change the security state uh, to the worse. We warn users that um, you can go ahead if you want to, but we strongly advise you not to do it. That's the kind of error not error message, warning message that you, that you uh, see when you try to install a routing tool of some sort. Um, likewise, there are some things that maybe external people consider malware like advertising spam that we don't consider malware or PHA. Um, that those would fall into the Moose category. Moose stands for mobile unwanted software. It's kind of equivalent to what people generally consider annoying. So advertising spam, or data collection that is maybe not bad enough to qualify for spyware, but just like these random data settings, like hardware identifiers that are maybe not that sensitive compared to someone reading your, your WhatsApp messages or whatever. Um, think of Moose as these applications or the behaviors of these applications just are kind of icky. They make your device less fun to use versus a PHA. Those are things that can actually harm you as the user. They can harm your devices uh, by escalating privileges, modifying security settings. So they can just harm your data by stealing it like phishing, by destroying it like ransomware, stuff like that. The third category of undesirable applications are just policy violations. That's anything that is not Moose or PHA, but Google just does not want to have on Google Play. So policy violations are strictly um, something about Google Play, right? You cannot have a policy violation outside of Google Play on a random website. Well, you can, the website could have a policy, but we don't. So policy violations are strictly about Google Play, stuff, stuff like pornography, gambling apps, uh, very violent apps, anything kind of copyright infringement, legal restrictions, there are certain countries that don't want certain applications are made available to their users. So those are the kinds of things that we have to restrict. The three days are nearly exclusively about PHA. So I wanna introduce the PHA categories to you. I don't do the same with Moose and Google Play policy violations. They are documented on our websites. You can Google for them and you can find them. If you have trouble, I can also point you in the right direction. So the first PHA category, they're backdoors. And I copy pasted the official definition of all the PHA categories onto the slides that I'm gonna present. But I'll give you a little bit of background of each. Um, I'll, I'll tell you in my own words what they kind of mean. So a backdoor is essentially anything that uh, allows an attacker to have uh, remote control over your device, right? Um, that's the old discussion of um, what is the difference between uh, a backdoor and a remote administration tool that is uh, in use? Uh, I'm sure Dartmouth uses it too for, for uh, uh, troubleshooting uh, computers or, or Android devices or iOS devices. Um, well, I, I guess as long as it's happening in, uh, in official capability with like uh, consent of the user, then it's gonna be nice. It's a, it's a help support tool of some sort. But if you do it surreptitiously, if you're an attacker who wants to steal stuff or wants to control a device, then we would flag that as a backdoor. That's obviously, it's a very, very problematic line to draw in practice sometimes. Then we have a category that's called billing fraud. Uh, this one's covered in this course, actually. There's gonna be a module about billing fraud, actually, in, in this course. Billing fraud is essentially any kind of uh, malware that, um, tries to charge the user through the mobile phone bill. And 
the common ways to do it is um, either you can send premium SMS or you can uh, make a, uh, a call to a premium number or you can do what's called toll fraud. And I'll tell you about, about it soon. Um, so call fraud where you call the premium number is essentially non-existent anymore on Android. So we're not gonna cover that. SMS fraud used to be the, uh, the number one category in, in the early days of Android. And I've got a trends uh, section later on where I talk about that. It has gone down because new protections were added to, uh, to the platform, which is a great example of, of what I said earlier, that the platform is ultimately responsible for protecting users and, and malware detection can only be a, a last ditch effort. But what's really hot these days is toll fraud. Toll fraud is, um, is a, a billing method that's actually not available in all countries or it's not popular in all countries. So you can actually, if you go to a certain websites, they can actually uh, charge you to your phone bill, uh, which is a really, really good feature, especially for countries where maybe credit card or other online payments are not very popular among the population, but they have phones and then they can just say, hey, yeah, I wanna pay this uh, website with my, with my um, uh, mobile phone bill. It's really cool, but it's easy to be abused. And so we're gonna cover that in this course here. Commercial spyware, uh, commercial spyware, as in contrast to spyware, which I will talk about later, commercial spyware is essentially, I want to spy on my wife, I want to spy on my husband, I want to spy on my friend, I want to spy on someone, whoever it is. Uh, commercial spyware is a way to monitor what the user does on their device. Usually it has functionality like, oh, uh, monitor SMS messages, monitor WhatsApp messages, monitor phone calls, these kinds of things yeah, it's, it's a really big problem especially in domestic abuse situations and so we we're trying to come up with better ways to uh, to protect users of domestic abuse from these kinds of applications denial of service is um, very standard a denial of service attack on, on google's infrastructure on anybody else's infrastructure on any kind of uh, system and resource that is uh, coming from um, from uh, Android applications. Now, the funny thing is, uh, the all of service attack doesn't have to be intentional. Uh, one, one curious example we saw is that um, an application that suddenly became very popular uh, had a hard-coded um, hard uh, method that just uh, at, at midnight every, every day, they, they pulled some data from a website, but as the application got so popular, it overwhelmed the website servers and so on. They, they got to us and said, you need to fix that. And uh, we worked with the developer to fix that. The denial of service, I think, is actually happening more often unintentionally than intentionally, which is kind of curious. We're gonna have a section in this course about that. Hostile downloaders is uh, are applications that are essentially shell applications. They pretend to be harmless, but what they really do is they download more PHAs. Um, it's the most common trick to circumvent Google Play scanning, which is um, you just upload uh, a seemingly harmless shell application that uh, then either automatically downloads the bad app or entices the user to download the bad app from a, from a third party website and then decide to load that. Very, very common, but it's, it's very technically trivial. So we're not covering it in this course. Non-Android threats. Sometimes we see Windows malware in, in um, Android applications embedded, usually because the development machine of the of the application developers actually infected themselves and they're developing on Windows and that the Windows malware just runs on their machine and checks themselves into uh, built zip files, which Android applications are zip files. Um, otherwise, non-Android threats could be um, applications that connect to websites that serve exploits, uh, Flash or PDF that may not actually be uh, uh, harmful to Android users. We just flag those more to notify the developer that they need to fix something. It's not actually protecting any users in that sense. Phishing, very standard, covered in this course. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for, for phishing uh, malware. You can steal someone's uh, bank accounts. Uh, you can steal someone's uh, login credentials for their Facebook. You can steal someone's uh, in-app, uh, in-game items of a popular game. Um, you can, and that's very popular actually on Android, you can steal someone's Instagram 
uh, credentials, um, whatever. Whenever some, some of that stuff is stolen, we flag the application as phishing. Elevated privilege abuse, uh, anything that kind of compromises the integrity of the system or if an application does something that shouldn't actually be possible. I think um, an example we had in the early days of Android was you are supposed to request the permission that's called um, send SMS if you want to send an SMS, but it turns out you could also send an SMS in some weird way if you just had the right SMS permission, um, which was not actually intended. And so we fixed it and we, we flagged applications that abuse that um, as what we call privilege escalation. Privilege escalation is, gets fairly rare these days because the, the system is just getting harder and harder to exploit. Um, so we don't actually have a lot of uh, privilege escalation. Ransomware, uh, very hot topic in the news. Everybody hears about ransomware attacks on universities, hospitals, companies all the time. Um, it's covered in this course. The good news is that ransomware is uh, not actually very prevalent on Android. It's, it's nearly non-existent, to be honest. Um, I think the reason for that is because on Windows, you have the opportunity for lateral movement uh, across a network if you, if you are if you infect one host in a, in a company or hospital or university, you can just move to the next host and then spread the damage across the network. You cannot actually do lateral movement like that on Android. And so there's no way to scale up ransomware. I think that's my personal theory. That's why ransomware just kind of never took off on Android. Rooting, code the rooster device, um, gets very rare these days. Um, also because the system is getting harder to exploit. The last very big vulnerability slash exploit that we've seen deployed against Android devices by malware was called Dirty Cow. Um, it's already a couple of years old again at this point. And before Dirty Cow, I think there was a two year gap in exploits used by malware. So that's extremely rare. Uh, attacks against the integrity of the system are extremely rare these days. Spam. Typical spam sends SMS to the contact list, sends emails to the contact list, very spammy. Um, I think Android devices don't actually make for a good spam uh, sending tool. So we don't actually see a lot of those. Uh, usually in the majority that we see is applications that are desperate to go viral in some way. And so they just invite all your friends without your consent. Uh, but even that kind of has has uh, declined in use. So spam is a very rare category in Android. We don't cover it in this course. Spyware, any kind of application which transmits uh, sensitive data to your, um, to your, not to your, uh, it's transmit sensitive data of the device, can be your photos, your SMS, your uh, contact list, all the kinds of stuff that are very personal, very sensitive, and kind of, yeah, I would say very much aligned with what the people in, in the, what, what the public uh, consider spyware. I think um, we are very much in agreement here. Trojans are interesting. They're covered in this course. Trojans are kind of a fallback, um, kind of a fallback category. If something is bad, but doesn't quite fit into, into any of the other categories. Um, and usually there's a deceptive component to it. Like something pretends to be a game, but it's really, really the game is just to make sure the user lets install it and keep it installed. And the, the malicious functionality happens kind of in the background. We label it as Trojan. There's a lot of that. We also, we tend to um, label applications as Trojans if they actually have the uh, ability to just execute a whole lot of malicious activities. Um, if something can can do um, uh, like SMS fraud or spying or uh, privilege escalation based on like a command and control server, we will probably label that as a Trojan. In general, there are three ways to distribute potentially harmful applications. The first one is Google Play. That's the default store in most countries. Um, the notable ex exception is China, which, which has a very different uh, store ecosystem. If you get your application in Google Play, 
you have uh, essentially a, a user base of billions of devices, let's say two to three billion. And so that makes it for a very lucrative target for malware authors, just like regular application developers to get their, get their application in, in Google Play. The risk, of course, for malicious applications is that you're being detected by Google Play Protect. We scan every application at upload time. And so unless you are sufficiently advanced and sneaky, uh, you may be caught. And if we, if we catch you, we're going to start processing you. We're going to start writing signatures. We're going to start updating the, uh, the machine learning algorithm to make sure that you um, are even less likely to get future versions of your app into Google Play. So it's a big risk. It's a trade-off between big user base and risk. Third-party markets and websites. Um, because of the vast space that I had mentioned earlier, it's very much less likely to be noticed by Google Play Protect because we can't cover everything. Um, but on the other hand, if you, if you uh, just use a random website or a less known store, you're gonna have a very small user base that you can potentially infect. And so you're gonna make your own trade-off. Uh, pre-installed is actually a very interesting category. There's a lot of pre-installed malware, unfortunately, on low cost and mid cost uh, devices out there, especially uh, targeting Southeast Asia, especially targeting Africa, Russia, to a lesser degree, South America. Um, it's not always coming from the device manufacturer. In fact, I would say the majority of pre-installed malware is not coming from the device manufacturer, rather, someone convinced the device manufacturer for some reason to install a certain piece of functionality um, and ship it on their device. And sometimes these, these stories are really convincing. I, I don't have the time to share them here. Um, but if you'd like to know more about this topic, I'm sure I can point you to public talks. Um, the good news is if you are a malware author and you would like to, um, you would like to uh, go down that route, you actually, you get a chance to get elevated privileges right out of the box, right? Because you can go to the device manufacturer and say, hey, I need re uh, less restrictive SE Linux policies, or I need to be installed in, in a certain folder that gives me more permissions than uh, an average application would get. And you also, you have another advantage that if you successfully convince a uh, device manufacturer to include your malicious app, you're gonna have hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands or even millions of devices um, immediately infected that's a very 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 lucrative uh, strategy go down so i think actually um the pre-installed space and the google play space they continue to remain very important for android malware the the third-party markets and websites i think is trending down a little bit in importance um just because it's much more difficult much less lucrative actually to to get a big installation base if you go down that route of site loading Let's look a little bit of Android malware trends over the past couple of years. I, I created a, a hard to read slide that I will actually, it looks like abstract art, but I will explain it to you. So I looked at the, the prevalence of uh, potentially harmful applications over the past 10 years in Google Play. And I did that as exactly for this one slide here. And it turned out to be fairly interesting. And so you can see these differently colored lines to show different trends of how significant a malware category was in a certain year over time. And those are trend lines, they're extremely abstract trend lines, but I really like the result. So if you look at the very top, there's this blue line, that's like a horizontal straight line. And that's actually spyware. That means spyware remained extremely relevant, always in the top three, I think even in the top two of most common um, PHA categories on Google Play over the past 10 years. Now, Spyware is very often unintentional spyware, meaning that uh, a lot of developers just misunderstand our, our data collection and data disclosure policies. And so very legitimate big applications, um, including Microsoft, for example, they accidentally fell into the spyware category at one point. And we know for sure that they didn't do it intentionally, they just didn't understand how restrictive our, our data collection policies are. And so just because there's a, a high prevalence of spyware across the board doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's malicious spyware. It's more like us trying to educate developers. 
but there's some other trends which are much more interesting. So there's a purple line that starts on the left upper corner, and there's a green line that starts on the left upper corner, and those are both going uh, fairly quickly down. So the purple line that goes down really fast is, what could it be? Uh, let's start with the green line, it's more impressive actually. Um, the green line is, SMS fraud, which I said was very prevalent at the beginning of Google Play and was um, very much uh, um, solved with system protections. Um, and the purple line, I think, is spam, which, which would make sense. Um, because we did, we did see a lot of, of spam at the beginning of um, of uh, Google Play in the in the situations that I uh, had described earlier with um, applications trying to go viral it was kind of solved and we revamped the permissions dialogues and everything. But I think what's more important um, are actually the trend lines that are going up because those are the trend lines that are immediately relevant and. We have two reddish trend lines that start in 2011, go up to 2020, and we have one green line that uh, starts in 2017 and uh, goes high in 2020. The green line is um, is DDoS, which I think is very interesting and that is going up so high. I do believe, based on the DDoS families that we looked at, none of them were actually trying to DDoS us. They just got so popular that they were coming uh, up as a potential DDoS on Google systems, um, but they had other, other manipulation, manipulative or malicious uh, goals in mind. Uh, the DDoS was just a side effect. The orangish and reddish ones that are going up from 2011 to 2020, the one that's higher up the, is toll fraud, which has essentially replaced SMS fraud as a quick way to uh, charge the user's uh, phone bill. Uh, so even though SMS fraud kind of has been solved, toll fraud took its place in many countries, especially those countries where it's a popular um, a popular uh, way to just, um, to just uh, bill users. Uh, the other one that goes up in red is click fraud, which is um, another trend that I will talk about later. Um, Click fraud is a huge problem. Uh, it's luckily not a problem that impacts Android users, but it impacts Android advertisers. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, this is also um, click fraud for what it's worth. It's the only non-PHA category that we are covering in this course. Click fraud is really uh, mobile unwanted software because it does not damage the device or harm the user or data. I got a couple of uh, years um, or a couple of uh, bullet points for each of the years to help you figure out um, what were the popular families, what happened really uh, in these years. I'm going to skip over them in the interest of time because I want to um, make sure that um, we uh, finish up on time for the next course to start. You can uh, pause the video later on when you watch this as a video. Uh, I give you a lot of information of what to Google for. And rather, I would like to uh, actually finish this uh, presentation by talking about um, some trends in, in one uh, final slide. Um, and that's this one. So when I think about Android malware trends, I think about technical trends, distribution trends, and economic trends. The technical trends, I always describe Android malware as uh, kind of like Windows malware, but uh, 10, 15 years behind. So there has been a long cat and mouse game history of uh, Microsoft versus malware authors of uh, antivirus companies on Windows versus malware authors. And so that cat and mouse game and they led to a lot of innovation in the malware space and led to a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of just very, very complex and technically challenging malware pieces on, on Windows. I don't think we're there on, on Android, which actually makes it very easy to get into Android malware research and Android malware reverse engineering. But what we definitely do see is that uh, malware authors are exploring to leave Java behind in favor of uh, native ARM code, um, which is written usually in C++, or even, even um, other languages that are available on Android, like .NET for Android, maybe Python. Um, 
we've even seen one Android malware that uh, downloaded a Linux shell and then executed bash scripts. I think the assumption by malware authors is just that um, all of the all of the um, defensive companies they have a pretty good stack to analyze Java code, but not such a good stack for these other um, potential uh, byte codes or native codes, um, which I think is true. So I think that's a, that's an interesting uh, development. Distribution trends also already mentioned. Either Google Play or pre-installed. Um, distribution over websites still exists, but kind of loses importance. Uh, it's very hard to get a user base going um, if you just distribute over a website. We do see, even if you're not at the level of complexity for as Windows, we do see malware being pushed by companies rather than by individuals. Um, in particular, in China, for example, there are legitimate malware shops which operate out in the open we know where their where their offices are we know how they hire who they hire we see that their job advertisements and so on so they're, they're really not individual actors they're companies in the malware space um, economic trend and i think that's a really interesting one i think android malware is very broadly a moving away from making a lot of money uh, of each individual user. Uh, for example, you can make a lot of money by phishing someone's bank account, by uh, asking for ransom to get back access to your files, by charging them on a phone bill, for example, is also a good one. But I don't think that's the trend. I think the trend is really, how can we extract a couple of cents, maybe a couple of dollars of economic profit of the device and make up for it at scale? And we see a lot of, um, problematic activity moving into SDKs, which are then deployed in thousands of applications with a reach of hundreds of millions of developers. They just do data collection and they sell the data or they do click fraud um, in advertising SDKs and so on. I think it's, it's, I think it makes sense from the way, way I think about it is that if you make very little damage, um, on an individual device level, you're less likely to be detected, you're less likely to be cared about by um, anybody, be it the defensive companies, be it the tech press, be it users, right? Um, if someone mines a couple of clicks um, of, of fraudulent ad clicks in the background over the day on your phone, you're not going to care. Um, and as a malware author, if nobody cares about your malware, it's uh, going to be installed for longer periods of time, which has a lot of value. So. I think that's that's an interesting economic trend that um, if anybody wants to research that, it would be an interesting topic, I think. There's a couple of uh, links that I want to share with you. Google Play Protect, Google Play Policy, Android Security Website. Android Security Reports are very interesting because those are our annual reports that we write about the state of Android and Android security. And then we have the the transparency report that I already mentioned as the last bullet point, um, which you can also check out for all kinds of uh, trends, not just related to malware, but also to other uh, aspects of Android security. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, does anybody have any questions for, uh, for that? First, uh, Sebastian, thank you so much. Great presentation and great way to get this course started. So yeah, so folks, please feel free to unmute and ask questions. Hi, Sebastian. Uh, I had just an easy question. Uh, if you quantitated how many, how, how much malware comes from apps downloaded and how much comes from pre-installed, uh, yeah, malicious software on devices? That's a, that's a really good question. And it depends on how you want to quantify it. There are, you, you, as if you want to get pre-installed malware, going on some device, you really have to be sophisticated. You have to have a team which can convince the device manufacturer to install it. That means you usually have a sales channel, you have an advertising channel, you have a, a development relationship channel and so on, in addition to just your malware development. There are very, very few actors out there which, um, which have the knowledge and capabilities and team size to pull that off. And so I would say, let's say there's maybe 20 different groups out there that have the capability to pull that off and that we have seen successfully pulled that off. 
But these 20 different groups, by virtue of immediately infecting hundreds of thousands or, or um, millions of devices, they have a very big footprint in the ecosystem. Um, throwing out numbers without looking at them, I would say right now, there's maybe 25 million devices at least out there that have pre-installed malware at least. Um, wouldn't be surprised if it's over 50 million. Um, and so very few actors, very large installation footprint. For malware that's just being distributed in third party um, uh, app stores or websites, there's a lot of people who can write a malicious app and upload it to a third party website. And so I don't have numbers for that. It's probably in the thousands. I wouldn't be surprised if they have a much larger footprint than even the pre-installed space. So it's probably more than the 25 to 50 million I quoted. But the, the return on investment for pre-installed malware is just much higher if you have the ability to pull it off. Yeah, just, just by, by nature of there being so many more malware authors who just create small time malware and upload it to random websites. It's probably still much larger than pre-installed, but in relation to the investment and to the team sizes and to the number of just malicious actors that have the capability, it's much, much more interesting and cost effective and devastating to, to Android users if you actually manage to get pre-installed malware going. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, hi. Hi, Sebastian. Um, may I ask one question about the um, one information you presented in the uh, future trends slides? There is um, something about it. Uh, the, maybe the first page. Oh, here it's here. Yeah, I mean the the one just you show. Uh, it's uh, you mentioned that there are technical trends. There are some um, moving to native code. Yeah. I'm wondering for the native code. Uh, for them uh, to use the latest code, uh, that the malware has to be pre-installed or they can be um, downloaded apps. Besides, what would it be the new challenges comparing to other kinds of malware? Right. So it can be it can be downloaded. Every application can have native code in it. In fact, you can write applications that don't contain Java code at all. You can write completely native applications. Mm -hmm. um, Usually it happens for games, for example, because many games are very sensitive to just the, the overhead in, in um, CPU requirements or memory requirements that Java has compared to a C++ or native code assembly. Or it happens on cross-platform um, applications where you write your code based on C++ or whatever, and then you can compile it to iOS and you can compile it to Android and you can work off on code base. Um, so, in fact, actually, um, a very large percentage of Android applications contain some kind of native code component, even, even, even the simple ones, because there are certain libraries that, that many applications ship which are open source, um, not originally coming from the Android world. Think of the open SSLs of the world or the, the graphic, um, the graphic uh, format decoders like libpng, zlib for uh, archives. There's a lot of open source libraries out there written in C++ that were not originally made for Android, but are just embedded in Android applications. Um, so the challenge really is, goes back to the old challenge of um, how do you analyze um, binary assembly code where you just don't have a lot of the meta information that is available for Java code and where it's much harder to understand the semantics of a piece of code than it is for Java code. I see. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, so please join me in thanking Sebastian with uh, a virtual clap. I'm clapping, but uh, uh, it's a little challenging. What I would suggest is that um, uh, we take a five minute break. It's now 1.04 according to my clock, Eastern time. 
and start with uh, JJ's presentation at 10 minutes past one. Does that seem okay, JJ, Sebastian? That works for me, I'll let JJ decide. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Okay, great. So, so JJ, maybe you could get your slides up and going and uh, we'll reconvene in five minutes so people get a chance to, you know, bio yeah, break, coffee, whatever. My slides. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. And it's now my pleasure to have as our next speaker, uh, JJ Ashad, uh, who'll be talking to us about uh, reverse engineering Android apps. Over to you, JJ. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so before we get to the uh, reversing like the known malware that my colleague is gonna present in the next two days, uh, I wanted to like give a very like basic uh, understanding of like how the Android works, how the app development works. So this way we can cover our bases and many of these topics might be already known to you. So, uh, so basically, basics of reversing apps. So the Android platform. So basically this is a high level architecture of the Android OS. So what happens is that OS, the Android is basically using the Linux kernel uh, as its kernel, which handles all sort of uh, driver management and power management, management and etc. Another layer on top of that is hardware abstraction layer, which deals with all sort of devices that are in the phone, like the camera, and it provides the abstraction to the upper layers. So the app. Above that, there is the native uh, C++ libraries with something like the WebKit and OpenGL are implemented. There is the Android runtime, which is uh, responsible for running the APKs in the virtual machines. On top of that, we have one of the main layers, which is the Java API framework, which provides all sort of APIs to the apps to develop all sort of functionalities. And on top of that, there are system apps, which are usually like included in the OS uh, by, uh, and like the email or calendar. And on top of those, there is the, run virtual machines to run different APKs and different virtual machines, uh, which is replacement for the Dalvik virtual machine we're gonna talk about later. And uh, yeah, we already, so the app fundamentals. So basically the apps are written in Java or Kotlin for most parts. And usually they are compiled to DEX files. Uh, in addition to that, uh, developers can use C and C++ to develop some native functionalities, such as like implementing crypto, something that they need like high speed and performance. And they usually are being packaged into the file as a .so file, which is a library version or is called the shared objects in the Linux operating system. And more interestingly, we can, uh, write apps in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, which is basically using the web view to integrate the web content, something we call the hybrid apps, that a lot of our malwares are uh, using this functionality for uh, launching their attacks, such as the phishing or the click fraud or the toll fraud, that tomorrow we have a session very specific and uh, basically the apps can use wide range of APIs that provide the Java free API framework, which is, which, which is uh, very comprehensive. So uh, every app have several components. The four main ones are activities, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. So activities are technically the 
it all they always or usually uh, represent a screen with the user interface, such as on an email app, you have an activity to show the list of new emails, or you have activity to compose a new email. And each app can have multiple activities and all these activities are independent of each other. So the life, the life cycle of the activity is usually like this. There is the activity, they have multiple events that the user have to, the developer has to implement, such as on create, on a start, on a resume. And on each, each of these stages, app goes to different uh, stages, like uh, when you do the on create, the on start, and it's gonna be in that state until something happens, either the activity pause, for example, you move the activity to the background, so the activity is gonna pause because it's about the user interface and the user is not interacting with it. And the way that user are interacting with the activity, it put the activity in different stages and there is the ability for the developers to take different actions on each of these states by implementing the functions and the events are here. So the services are uh, the entry point for keeping uh, the app to run some background uh, functionality. For example, playing music in the background, like fishing data from network, and these type of things that they don't need the user interaction and uh, they can always run in the background and use the, uh, use the CPU or the, the and they don't usually have the user interface. Uh, the broadcast receivers are allow the system to deliver the events to different apps. This is basically how many apps like communicate with, you, with each other. So it basically allows the app to respond to like system-wide events or events that are being generated by the other apps. For example, uh, you are in a, uh, maybe your email app and you click on a map uh, link and it te technically open a Google map or other maps, uh, other apps that are doing the map stuff uh, and show the location on those apps basically. So the way it works is that the Gmail app is gonna say, okay, um, I want to open this link and it broadcasts and the, the Google map can understand this and, and says, okay, I can handle this request. And they don't usually have a user interface either. And for the content providers, they usually manage a shared set of app data can be stored like on persistent locations such as the file system or the database. And other apps can query or modify the data uh, if they have the proper permissions that we're gonna talk about in future slides, what the permission is. So as I said, uh, different apps and different components uh, should have a way to communicate with each other. Uh, and it usually happens through intents. So intents are some kind of message that are being transferred between, between different apps and different components. Uh, for example, some app wants to auto open another app, so starting an activity, or an activity wants to open another activity on the same app, so they use the intent to start the activity, or starting a service, or delivering the broadcast. As I said, this is how the Gmail apps led say, okay, I'm looking for someone to open this link for me and the Google map, get the broadcast and we're gonna respond to it. Uh, so there are basically two types of intents, explicit intents and implicit intents. So explicit intents should be, specific, uh, should be specified explicitly by the app that what kind of package wants to be the receiver of this intent or this message. And usually it happens through providing the app's package name. So what happens is that on each machine or on each phone or the Android, 
uh, all the apps have to have a package name and it's usually better to be something unique that this is the way the app knows each other based on the package name. But the implicit, implicit intents usually declare is some kind of general action to be performed, such as opening the map. And uh, they usually send out as a broadcast a different maps apps on the phone, such as maybe the Apple map and the Google map can receive this. Rather than can, record, can handle this request. So when using the implicit, Intents, uh, the target apps usually have to say what kind of action they need, they, they are able to handle using the intent filters that's gonna describe in their manifest file. Another thing are the map res app resources. The app resources are usually like static files. Uh, and such as the bitmaps, the layout definition, some kind of a constant strings that are being used by the developer inside the app and they usually be placed in the res slash directory. On the right side of the slide, you can see how usually a project in the Android looks like. There is a source directory. So this is the rough estimate they can have like uh, multiple like subdirectories, and there is a res directory inside that there are like multiple different directories for the bitmaps for the layouts which are in xml for the drawable and etc uh, so app manifest is the main one of the very main files in the app which basically tells the Android device, how to communicate with this app and what kind of functionality this app is capable of. For example, it's inside the Android manifest.xml, the app is provide their package name, the, the activities that they have, the components, the broadcast, uh, they can handle through the intent filters on the right. For example, you can see somebody can say, okay, I can do like Android interaction that insert and somebody say, okay, I want someone to do the insert. This app can say, okay, I'm able to do it. Another thing is the, uh, uh, the permissions, uh, which is, uh, sorry. Uh, which tells the, the Android what kind of permissions they are accessing to. So as you know, the permissions can be very sensitive. They might access all sort of uh, important information. That's why the apps have to say, okay, I need this kind of permission, such as the send MS, SMS here. And the Android upon installing the app is gonna ask user if you want to allow this app to be able to do this kind of thing, such as sending SMS or not. And it's up to the user to decide if allow or not. So every app should say what kind of permission they need. And upon installation, they're going to ask, the Android is going to ask the user, okay, are you okay with this app to have this permission or not? So another thing uh, that's very important is the platform version and API level. As you know, the Android has like multiple versions. It came out like a long time ago and every year or every month or so they add new functionality and sometimes they deprecate some functionality. So the app should know that what kind of an Android version it, it wants to uh, run on or what kind of Android version is not suitable or suitable for this app. So that's why we have something called the API level, which tells you the, the, the API version of the current Android device. And every app should define three different uh, attributes in the, uh, in the manifest, technically, that tells, okay, what is the minimum API level that required for the app to run, which is called the mean SDK version, because the app might use some new APIs that are not available in the older versions. 
There is the target SDK version that usually this is the version that the app is supposed to work on the best. And there is the max SDK version, which tells what is the maximum Android version the app can run. So this is a latest uh, API level and platform version that I got from the Android website. As you know, the Android 11 was released like yesterday or a few days ago. And for each version, uh, you have different API levels. So at the moment we are at the API level 30. And as you see, there's a code name for each of the Android version. And starting in Android 10, the version, the code name started to uh, not be about some kind of food. So that's a good thing. Uh, at the moment we have Android 11, which is version 11, and there is the API level 30. So the Android SDK. So the Android SDK is basically a package or all the tools that is required for the developers to create the apps, to build the apps and to analyze the apps and et cetera, and to run the apps. So there are four main categories. There are like command line tools, there are build tools, there are platform tools, and there are other tools such as the system images that the emulator. So command line tools, uh, I'm gonna go very quickly over the tools that they provide in each package. I just pick, I just picked like a few of the important ones. Otherwise there are like even like more than this number of tools in the Android SDK when you install. So there is the APK analyzer that allows some immediate insight into the, uh, into the APK file. The SDK manager is one of the very important ones which allow you to install, uninstall, update the packages for the SDK because for new versions you might have, for the new versions of the Android, you need to like download some additional file in order to run the Android, the last Android. So the SDK manager is the tool that you need. So there is the AVD manager, uh, which is uh, responsible for creating and managing Android virtual devices which basically allows the developers to run the apps on the local machine without need to install it on an actual phone. So it makes the development very, very easy. Uh, you can immediately change the uh, like code, like run it, and it's gonna run on a local emulator immediately. And you can see the changes without the need to like push it into some kind of uh, Android device and uh, try to run the app. There are build tools, which is all the tools that are required for building and packaging the files. Uh, there are multiple things. One of the important ones are the APK signer here, which technically allows you to sign the APKs so, and like verify the signature APKs for a secure so every developer uh, has some kind of key that they sign the APK and allow the Google knows that, okay, this file has been signed by this developer so they can have do the attribution if something goes on later. Uh, there are other tools here for building the files into classes and the text files. The platform tool are, is one of the important ones. The main one is the ADB or Android Divide Bridge, which technically allows you to communicate with the emulator or the virtual devices, such as installing the app, uninstalling the app, sending broadcast, opening activity. So any kind of uh, functionality that the user can do with an app can be used the ADB from the command line, which is very uh, cool if you wanna do some kind of automation or debugging. And uh, eventually we have system images and the platforms at the emulator. So as I said, for every version, 
of the app for every version of the Android, you uh, have a new system images, which is the image, which is technically the image of the Android for different platform because you're running, because you're usually running uh, the app on the local emulator and many of our machines are x86 for example or it might be different architecture rather than the one on the phone devices uh, we can download different system images with different api versions as you can see here the android 29 and choose our devices and the api and you create a virtual device using the everyday manager and eventually we can run it through the emulator and we can test our app so there are like tens of different like system images and android uh, uh, versions combinations that you can download using the sdk manager so as you see there's a lot of tools out there there are uh many uh, tools and sometimes it's very complicated for huge apps to, so you in order for you to do it like manually to run everything through the bash and you know uh, managing your project writing those huge xml files for the user interface or manifest that's why we have the android studio which takes care of all of those things in a very nice ide that provides all those tools that I mentioned to an integrated uh, uh, environment, such as you can develop the UI layouts, you can also the building and debugging, you can integrate with the emulator for running apps and installing, uninstalling the SDK versions. And it's free and we are at the 4.0.1 is the latest version. So you probably all seen it in person. So uh, we're gonna have a very simple demo at the end, just just in case, and talk about the Android Studio. So we talk all about these topics and uh, these uh, introductions in order to get to the reversing the apps. So. As you know, the malwares, the malware apps are nothing more than another app, another regular app with malicious intent. And they have to be developed by the same set of uh, techniques and components and SDK that I mentioned here. And they need to be installed on the, app, on the Android devices and basically do their malicious thing. That's why uh, it was very important to know how exactly apps are written or apps are developed. And as we know that, then we can start uh, learn about like reversing those apps to understand what they're doing. So technically there are two different types of analysis here, the static and dynamic. So in the static analysis, you don't run the app anywhere. You do stuff such as like unpacking disassembly decompilation and go through the files that are being packaged with the app and with the apk on the other hand the dynamic analysis involves like running the app usually in the emulator and inspecting the behavior because sometimes as my colleague is going to talk about it in future uh slides or in future uh sessions that sometimes the app are doing some kind of up, obfuscation. So it make it hard for the others to understand the app aesthetically. That's why sometimes we need to run the apps dynamically as well in the emulator or on the device even, and try to monitor the behavior because those obfuscation are gonna be gone at the execution time. One of the very famous ones are uh, DCL, we call it, or dynamic code loading. What happens is that the apps do not have the code in the APK, but as soon as, as, soon as they're running, they're gonna download some additional code from some CNC server and run that specific code. 
So dynamic analysis is really going to be helpful in those cases to under, unravel some of those uh, obfuscated behaviors and involve debugging, uh, logging all the API invocations, even looking at the network traffic. So before we get to that, uh, I'm gonna go very quickly on how the app composition happens. So you need to know how uh, the developer works in order to do the reverse of that. So as you know, like the apps are coming as a APK file, dot APK. And what happens is here is that on the right side, the developers usually develop their code in Java and Kotlin. In general, they're going to be compiled into the Java bytecode, and eventually, using the Dex compiler, those Java bytecodes going to be converted to the Dex bytecode, and finally, it's going to be executed by the Dalvik virtual machine. So, Dalvik virtual machine was the legacy virtual machine for the Android devices, but at some point. Uh, Google switched to the Android switched to ART or the Android runtime, which is very more performant and more efficient in terms of like memory and execution. Uh, so technically Dell, DVM and ART are doing the same thing. So in order to do this for security purposes, uh, usually the ART and the Dalvik virtual machine run each APK in different virtual machines to provide some sort of isolation between them so they don't mess with each other processes. So the Android package file format is nothing more than a zip archive. You can easily unzip the file and, and you can see on the left side, it's gonna unzip all sort of file, the classes that text which contain all the code that you develop into the with the Dex uh, uh, small with the Dex uh, bytecodes. There is the Android manifest, all the resource files that we talked about, and as you can see on the right side, it has multiple uh, files and directories inside the APKs. Uh, the leaves are containing all the native. Uh, libraries that talk about the classes that they are the bytecode, the, sign the, the signature uh, are in the meta and in the asset there are some other files in the resource, some other resource files, etc. However, uh, as you see here, there are two files that are not in a human readable format. There's a classes.dex and there's the resources.arsc, which for uh, performance reasons, they, uh, for the resources actually, for the performance reasons is being uh, packed into this one file. And if you unzip the APK, you're not able to understand those files. That's why we have a tool called the APK tool, which is in addition to unpacking the APK, it also decodes the manifest and resources. Also the manifest is in a coded version for the, because it could be very huge. So it's gonna unpack and decode the manifest and resources and also disassemble the decks to the smart device. So, uh Hey, JJ, could I interrupt you for the question? Sure. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide, please? Uh, yeah. Could you explain what the uh, backsmothering step includes uh, for the classes.dex file? Yeah, and actually, I, I was planning to talk about it in the next slide. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah in the, no problem. So, uh, as you know, for the L file or the binary file, uh, you have the assembly language. So what you do, you write your code in assembly and you assemble that code into the nat native code. And when you disassemble a native code back to the assembly code. So a small is technically the assembly language of the, the DEX format. So what happens here is that 
when you write uh, your code in Java, it's going to compile the Java byte code and eventually to the Dex format. In order to have a text representation of that Dex format and make it like human readable, they created a language called the Smalley. The back of Smalley is technically is the disassembling of the Dex byte code, which is a binary format, to a text version, which we call it like the Smalley language. As you can see here, it's uh, uh, it's quite look like the Java uh, because it was basically a Java that converted to this language. But it's, uh, it's it's technically its own language that tells you about how uh, what methods you have, how the um, the functions are being called. There are like some differences between the Smalley format and the bytecode format that probably my colleagues are gonna go through it. I'm not gonna go in detail here, but uh, this is the way that you usually need to like look at the code yourself. But as I talk about in the, in the next in the next couple of the slides, you don't usually deal with this file because you have some awesome like decompilers that takes this file and put it into the Java code. And that's a lot easier to understand and read. Uh, it's just like uh, here for the decompilation might fail and you, and you need to look at the smiley file yourself. Did that answer your question? Um, yes. So uh, would would the APK would all the services in the APK uh, eventually show up in the same Smalley file when you uh, or the Dex file when you unzip it? Uh, only the classes that Dex. I mean, the APK have a lot of different files, some XML files, some resources, app manifests, and the main part is the code. The Java code and the Kotlin code that is being eventually compiled to a DEX file. Okay. And Smalley and Back is Smalley is all about the, the, the classes, the DEX file that we talked about here. Okay. Otherwise, the other files are mostly in the text format. You don't need to do anything about them. So as I said, the, the compilation, it's even easier. It's converted DEX into Java code and it's a lot easier for the reverse engineers to understand. There are so many tools out there, such as DEX to JAR, to convert the DEX to the JAR files. There's the JDGUI, which is for decompiling dot classes to the, 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 the Java file. But the main, but the very interesting tool that we're gonna uh, use for the rest of this course is the JADEX and JADEX GUI that convert the DEX to the Java file directly and it handles a lot of things. And it open your APK, you can look into the APK, it, do, it does also the decoding, the unpacking and everything. So you have, you, you can basically, drop an APK into the JADEX and it unpack it and decode it and you can look at everything. So it's a very awesome tool that's going to be used for the rest of the school and, use, and it's your friend. And basically that's the first step you need to do if you want to reverse an APK. So this is a very uh, screen from the, the JADEX. As you can see, you can open APK here, like the test.apk. It do the compilation. You can go through the source code. You can see different uh, classes here. You have the resources folder that it unpacks the assets, the resource, the res file, the res directory, the signature, and the Android manifest. Uh, another thing is like encoding and encryption. Apps usually use encoding and encryption for various purposes. And in the malwares, that's something they use a lot in order to make the analysis even harder, mostly like a static analysis. So there's a tool out there, the CyberChef, that provides all sort of decoding, like encryption, decryption, and encryption, and encoding 
uh, and as you can see here, you can very easily, as a very nice UI that you can play with to do all sort of decoding and encryption and decryption. And this is very good for you to, uh, while you're reversing an app, you have this on your side and sometimes you need to do some decryption in order to move forward into the reversing the app. Uh, another topic you want to talk about are the native. So, so far we all talked about the Java files, the DEX files, and something very important that uh, I need to talk about is the native code. Uh, native code are being uh, supported by the Android development. And usually we need them uh, for fast functionality, such as like cryptography. And they usually, they, they will be written in C++ and they're packaging the APK as a .so file. And interestingly, the Android allows the Java code and the C++ code to communicate with, with each other through the JNI or the Java native interface that allows them to call each other's method. So it, it, brings, it brings a lot of interesting functionality but at the same time, it creates an opportunity for the malware authors to utilize this to make the code analysis even harder because the decompilation and disassembly and all the reversing techniques that we talked about can be even harder in the uh, native code rather than like the Java code. That's why we've seen a lot of other uh, malware authors like move their function, the bad functionality into the native code. <clears throat> so one of my colleagues gonna talk about this very in detail. And the Android provides the Android native development kit to make, to simplify the native code development. So for the reversing native code, uh, the .so file generated by the native code are basically L format, so you can work with those like shared objects libraries, uh, in the way you were dealing with, or dealing with L formats such as uh, read L, like object dump. These are very uh, basic tool in the Linux. Uh, there are some uh, uh, famous and effective like third party tools. So that's Radar Two and Gidra, which Gidra is the this one, as, as I think, because it has all also the disassemble, disassembler and the decompiler for many platforms. Uh, I believe IDA has the same thing, but since uh, you have to pay for it, the, uh, that's bad. But the Gidra is pretty free and it has decompiler disassembler for different platforms. The reason the ARM platform is important here is that many Android devices are uh, on the ARM devices and the .so files and the L format are, uh, are customized for the L, customized for the ARM format. That's why you need the compilation for the R format in order to, you know, understand and decompile and analyze the native code package with the APK. So this is a very rough, uh, uh, screenshot of the Gidra. Uh, uh, if you work with IDA, it might uh, look very uh, not easy to work with, with the Gidra. Uh, like it, it doesn't have a, like a very nice UI, but you know, it's free. So deal with it. Uh, for the dynamic analysis, so most of this stuff was about uh, static analysis and static analysis in the main part of our analysis. And usually the dynamic analysis comes after war to help us out understand some functionalities but that we were not able to do the aesthetic and to understand it with the aesthetic analysis. So the aesthetic analysis in the main one and most of the time you're gonna figure out <clears throat> the app by the aesthetic analysis but sometimes you need the dynamic analysis as well. So there are multiple like tools here. Uh, one of the very famous one is Frida to 
to instrument API invocations and understand, and understand what the app is doing. For inspecting the traffic, you can like configure the Android proxy for your traffic to go through some kind of proxy such as the MITM proxy or Web3. And even you can install the certificate so you can man in the middle HTTPS traffic and understand what the app is doing. So the demo is gonna be very, very uh, simple. I'm just gonna look at the uh, the Android Studio. I just created a project that you can simply open. So, um, as you see here on the left side, you have different like folders for different things. One of the uh, main uh, layouts, uh, and you can easily, you know, play with things, include things. So it makes the UI development pretty easy and it's quite interesting to work with. And you know, like, it's awesome. And the main one is the code that you can develop your code here for any of those buttons and text box I created, you can develop any kind of code here. As we talk, the activity here is the uncreated and you can do all sort of things. You can implement more and more of the uh, callbacks and the events here to do different things here. And uh, let me see what else we have. Uh, yeah, the Android manifest that I talked about. It's a very important file. You have the package name, you have the activity definition. So for most of the cases, when you change something or add new activity, this file is gonna be updated automatically. It makes your life a lot easier, you know, to, to work and develop. Uh, so another important thing I wanna talk about is the SDK manager. Remember all the tools that we talked about there? So the Android Studio provides a very nice uh, interface so you can install different you know, SDK that you want for your uh, Android app. Another important part is the AVD manager, which as you can see, can allow you to create virtual devices. You can easily create virtual device, choose the phone that you want, any of these versions. Uh, you can have like multiple uh, system images that you're planning to. So, so for this phone version, uh, there are these, these are the recommended uh, system images that we talk about and uh, so it usually takes some time to download, you know, these uh, system images. That's why I already created a uh, uh, a phone with the API queue, and you can easily run the app. And what it does is that use the use the main emulator I created or the only one and open it. So you can play with the emulator. And hopefully it's still running, compiling the app. So, you know, you can like work with the Android emulator. So it opens the app. So you can play with your app and see, you know, 
what it's doing or how's it working. So this is the part for the Android uh, Studio. So usually it creates a directory Android Studio projects. I created a project test one and it has a bunch of like subdirectories. And as you can see here, this is the final APK that's created. So this is the debug version. That's why it's app.debug.apk. But if you change the configuration to build you a release format, it's gonna be app-release.apk. And you can easily run the, just turn this off. So you can use the JADI GUI, JADX GUI and app debug APK. So as you can see, it opened the app that we developed. The name here, the source code, the main app we talked about, it decompiles everything from the DEX format. All the resources, the manifest file that we had, see all the information that they put here, the package name, in the intent filters, the activity, uh, in the resources, you see all sort of resources, uh, the meta information, yeah, and the source code and everything. So as you can see, it's just the JADX uh, is doing everything for you and like unpack the APK and shows you everything. So yeah, this was, I tried to be very uh, uh, like provide the basics, not go into much details. And I hope uh, it was interesting and not boring. Thank you, JJ. This was great. And I think, uh, uh, again, you know, I, I'm going to speak for everybody without getting everybody's input, but I think people really appreciated it. I got a couple of comments, you know, um, during your talk saying, you know, people are really enjoying it. So thank you so much. Uh, let me throw the floor open to questions from folks in the audience. Again, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, JJ. Hey. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so for most of the tools you showed are the, I mean, maybe the reverse engineer on the APKs. I mean, most of them I think are, are on the single APKs, right? So maybe okay. in our research, we were trying to do it in batch or at a large scale, maybe we say 10K or 100K. So do you know, mm -hmm. are there any available tools for kind of batched reverse engineering? Uh, I think there are a bunch of libraries out there. Like one of them I get to know was like FlowDroid. Actually, most of these tools that I talked about with the UI, they are mostly developed in Java and they provide the library as a Java library that you can call in your program. I personally uh, haven't used any of those tools in a, uh, programmatical way. At Google, we develop our own tools from scratch. So we build a bunch of like static analysis and dynamic analysis tool that we're using. But uh, I cannot tell you a very specific third party library that you can use uh, in a public for that purpose. Okay, thank you. Do you mind if I jump in for a second, JJ? Yeah, sure, sure. I was just going to point out that um, uh, in addition to libraries you can use, there are systems that are provided by uh, security research companies or antivirus companies uh, where they have like a dynamic analysis engine that you can use as a, as a service, but uh, frequently um, 
at least the interesting features are usually paid only. So um, I don't think I'm aware of anything that does analysis at scale straight out of the box. You either are going to have to, you know, pay for something or uh, use a library to implement something yourself. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alec. That's very helpful. Any other questions? Um, I have one. So uh, most of these apps are available on the Play Store, right? So we don't directly have access to the uh, to the APK files. So uh, how do we actually go about analyzing such applications? Uh, I didn't quite understand your question. So the uh, application is available on the Play Store and we don't really have access to the APK directly. Um, how do we okay. uh, go about analyzing such applications? Uh, I think you, you should be able to download the APK uh, from the website. But one thing, one hacky way might be is to download uh, the APK on your phone and connect to it like through the ADB, in the shell and like download the APK from your phone. Because what happens is that your, your phone connects to the like play a store, download the APK and unpack it on the system and you can use it. And the APK file should be there for you to grab it. But uh, as far as I know, you should be able to download the APK uh, through the website. For example, for the Google extensions, even though there are no official way to download the CRX file, there are some extensions that, you know, download it for you because it's just there, but you don't, you don't have the direct link to it. But uh, I personally haven't like downloaded APK from the Google store directly. So if the other guys know a way to do that, they can let us know. I generally actually do the way that you described where I just load the apps from play onto my testing phone and then use ADB to export the files onto a storage device so that I can reuse them later. That's generally the procedure that I follow. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, at the end of the day, there must be some like pro protocol in place to download the APK. And I guess there must be some like third party tools out there that people allow you to download an APK from the Google Play Store. But yeah, the, this like downloading on the phone and then exporting the APK is one of the things. Awesome. So I think with that, um, we'll you know, thank you again so much, JJ, for your excellent presentation. I think this is really, really helpful for many of us, uh, you know, as we sort of grapple with uh, things you guys probably have thought about quite a lot more than we have. So thanks a million. And let's do the following. Let's take again a five minute break. Uh, the clock shows 2.04. So let's reconvene at 2.10 for uh, Roman stock on um, uh, ransomware. So again, we're running a few minutes late, but not too bad. Again, everybody, thank you so much, JJ. Great presentation. Really appreciate it. Sure. And you can see I'm wide awake and busy. Yeah. Taking, I don't know if you can see him taking notes, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Uh, hopefully for uh, tomorrow uh, presentation for hybrid apps. Fantastic. Thanks again. And Roman, if you get a chance to put your slides up in the next five minutes, you know, uh, we should be ready to go at 210 Eastern, 1110 Pacific. Thanks. Okay, great. And I can see your slides, Roman. Wonderful. So, Eastern. Um, welcome back, everyone. It's 10 minutes past 2 Eastern. And it's now my pleasure to welcome Roman Unicek from Google to speak about uh, ransomware on the Android platform. Over to you, Roman. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the train on ransomware. 
Kurosawa agenda. So we'll start with uh, definition, then we will go through main uh, techniques used by ransomware like device admin abuse, file encryption, and uh, other layers apps. And in the end, we'll go to examples and uh, we'll review a few apps uh, in the compiler. So I will use JADX uh, and uh, if you uh, still want to download it, I will suggest you to use unstable version because it's actually way better than the disabled version of JADX. Uh, yeah, let's start with definition of the ransomware. So here you can see uh, our like, official uh, definition of the ransomware. You can find it on developers.google.com. Uh, uh, so by ransomware, we understand uh, code that takes actual or extensive control of a device or data on the device and demands that the user make a payment or perform an action for this control. So in general, it's something that uh, locks you out of your phone or out of your data, and then it asks you to make a payment. So usually that's it. Um, I also want to highlight that there are some legit apps with similar behavior that we consider as false positive for ransomware. And I'm talking about device management apps. So these apps were created specifically for like corporate, uh, for, for like companies, uh, so they can uh, remotely log uh, or wipe the device that was uh, compromised for some reason or it's stolen and it's like that. So in general, they may use techniques similar to ransomware. They uh, can like reset the password, they can like, encrypt data, they can log the user out of the device, but uh, they have adequate uh, user disclosure and they actually don't ask the user to pay for like pay a ransom. Uh, so they have legit purpose and uh, good reason uh, to do that. So yeah, let's start. Um, with ransomware techniques. Um, there are three main techniques used by ransomware uh, to achieve uh, their goal. First of all, ransomware apps uh, abuse device administration API uh, to log the user of this device. You can find uh, more information about device administration API uh, by the link. We'll talk about that later in the presentation. So in general, device administration API was created uh, for mobile device management. Uh, yeah. Another technique that commonly used, not commonly, but sometimes used by ransomware apps, is to encrypt files on the device and demand the payment to encrypt files. So that's something that's commonly used uh, by like Windows or in, like, uh, non mobile ransomware, uh, but it's not so commonly uh, used uh, on mobile. And the third technique is to uh, evaluate other apps with a malicious UI, making it impossible to use uh, the infected device. So these apps can uh, show their own um, malicious UI over all other like, apps or other UIs, uh, so the user won't be able to use the device. Okay. Let's start with device admin. Uh, so, device admin, device administrator, uh, administrator API, um, it's a API created for mobile device management. Uh, the app, uh, if the app um, wants to use it, uh, it needs to ask the user to grant this, uh, to grant access to the device admin API, actually activate the app as a device administrator on the device. Uh, it can be done only through system UI, not through like, the app. And the system will show the possibilities that will be available for the app. Uh, also, it can be worked only in the settings app. So by default, um, the user won't be uninstall the app, will be able to uninstall the app of uh, the active device administrator. Um, yeah. Uh, so here you can see that the app uh, can change the screen log, uh, set password rules, and log the screen. Uh, it's called policies, and the app needs to declare these policies in advance, so it won't be able to do anything that is not part of these policies. And this uh, 
API is installed with depreciated. However, most dangerous features are still available in Android 10. In Android 11, uh, which was released like yesterday, uh, some of the most dangerous features were replaced with like, other APIs with a similar behavior, uh, but it demands more interaction with the user, which makes them less dangerous. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, policies for device administrator. So there are three dangerous policies. Uh, one policy for my data. So it allows the app uh, to do to perform a factory reset of the device. Uh, first of all, it allows the app to load the device, uh, and this actually means that the user will be sent to the like, lock screen, so they will have to enter their uh, password. And the third policy is reset password. So uh, the app with this policy declared is actually able to reset the password of encode on the device uh, and set a new password. Um, and for every of these uh, policies, uh, there are methods that use to do that. So these methods are web data, log now, and reset password. So they're pretty, they have pretty obvious names. Uh, so how to detect if the app is using uh, device admin. So the app will have to declare it in the Android manifest file. Uh, so you can go to Android manifest and search for receiver for action uh, for intent android.app.action.deviceadmin-enable and the receiver should also declare permission android permission by device admin. Uh, so without um, these conditions, the app won't be able to use, won't be able to ask the user to grant uh, access to device admin. Uh, another interesting thing that you can uh, see here uh, is the second line, uh, Android resource, uh, end of the second line, Android resource, and then XML, QQ1838. That's actually an XML file with policies uh, for the app. So if you go to uh, res XML folder uh, in the APK, you'll find there uh, an XML file with the name QQ183 and so on. Uh, and you can see it in the, uh, on the slide. Uh, so it will list available policies for the APK, like limit password, reset password, and first law. Uh, so if the app did not declare one of uh, these policies, it won't be able to actually do that. So how to use that? Uh, here's an example. Um, so the app, uh, in this example, the app uh, calls reset password method from device policy manager uh, and reset the password. Uh, so you can see it in line 112 and it sets a new password coded from line second, uh, 22. Uh, so the new password will be nine, uh, one to seven. So it's some kind of loaded uh, password from the app, and the app uh, will just set a new password uh, not created by the user. Uh, another interesting thing on this screenshot is lines uh, 107 through 109. Uh, that's actually the part where an app is trying to convince user uh, to enable device administrator for the app. Uh, so it starts new intent at device admin, and that actually will open settings uh, app uh, with uh, the dialogue that I showed before for device admin. Uh, so as a next step, uh, as for now, the app uh, already reset, uh, reset the password, set a new password. Uh, so the next step, they need uh, to log the device so the user will be sent uh, to the lock screen. And that's where the user will find out that, uh, the password is something new, uh, not what they said. Uh, so that's the next step. Uh, 
ransomware, I need to somehow um, ask the user to pay a ransom. Uh, some apps may implement their own lock screen for those purposes, uh, but in this case, uh, the app just shows uh, a toast, some a small windows that will be visible to the user, and it asks uh, the user to contact uh, criminals through QQ Messenger. But that's, yeah, another reason to uh, for the ransomware or to malicious apps to abuse device uh, admin uh, is to be persistent. So, as I said, uh, the app can be uninstalled uh, through a like, regular way of installing apps if it was activated as a device admin. Uh, so, the user need go to the settings app and deactivate device admin for the app uh, before that, before installing the app. And whenever the user uh, is trying to deactivate uh, device admin for the app, on disable request callback will be called from the app. So the easiest way to abuse that uh, for an app is to call start activity uh, from this callback. In this uh, specific example, the app is actually start settings app and then it like, sends the user to the home screen uh, starting activity. Other ways uh, that malware uses to gain persistence is to call, for example, lock now or uh, dot sleep from this callback. Uh, it allows them to uh, interfere with the user while uh, the user is trying to disable um, yeah, device admin. So by doing that, they are gaining some persistence on the device. So, uh, but it won't work like that in all Android versions. I think that it won't work at all in Android 10 or so. Um, yeah, next, uh, ransomware behaviors uh, in filters. Uh, so that's kind of pretty simple behavior. Uh, the app needs to go through some files, uh, decrypt them, and uh, delete original files. Uh, and they use pretty common API for that. I think that there are tons of apps uh, having these APIs, but probably not in the same order as ransomware uses them. Uh, so in general, they need to list files, um, read file, read every file, encrypted, delete original file, save, uh, encrypted file, and repeat. After that, they need to uh, show ransom, asking uh, the user to pay. So here's an example how a map, uh, here's an example of a method that will go through all files in the folder. Um, so as you can see on the line 55, it actually compares uh, the file extension with some list of extensions. So this app uh, is only interested in uh, different media files and doc files. And then tries to encrypt it, uh, line 63, and delete the original file on line 64. And it's doing it recursively for all including, uh, included directories. Uh, you can see it in lines 70 and 71. So here is a method uh, where the app actually encrypts files. So it uses, um, standard Java Android API uh, cipher. Um, so that's, that's pretty basic. Uh, just actually just a few calls uh, to do that. They need to initialize cipher, then uh, send buffer to this cipher, cipher and in the end call to final uh, to actually encrypt all bytes. That, that's basically it. So it's pretty simple. In some cases, they may use, um, they may implement uh, algorithm, encryption incre 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 algorithms by themselves, but in most cases, they actually uh, use just something from Cypher. And yeah, so as I said, it's, as you may know, uh, different ransomware encryptors. I've been all over the news uh, 
and then pick like uh, yeah di different companies and so on. Uh, the thing is that it's not very popular on Android. Uh, maybe because uh, most files on your device are being like backup in cloud, and you actually all all your images are in some cloud image service and so on. So uh, you probably don't actually care about your files a lot. So that may be one reason why they don't do that. And the third way and the most common technique uh, used by ransomware is to overlay other apps. So in general, it looks like uh, it works like that. The ransomware app uh, need, needs to trap a foreground app. And whenever the foreground app is not a ransomware app, it actually needs to start uh, its own activity from the background. Um, so basically, that's it for this type of ransomware. Let's take a look at uh, the techniques they use. Uh, so to monitor foreground app, um, this ransomware, most of ransomware apps uh, are using get running tasks API, uh, but it was depreciated in Android app. So after that, they started uh, started reading a uh, broad file system. Uh, and it's not available, uh, it's not readable for third party apps anymore, starting from Android L. In Android L, uh, usage stats uh, manager API was introduced. It allows the app to do, like, to track foreground apps. It allows the app to do many different things, including track uh, of the foreground app. So the thing is that. It's not only protected by special permission uh, that says to this uh, API should be granted by the user in a like, special UI from the settings app. Uh, so it's not just regular permission. So the user will uh, see additional dialogue with uh, some details on that app. And uh, they also, uh, some ransomware apps may also use accessibility API to track uh, foreground app. We'll talk a little bit more on accessibility abuse uh, during our next uh, training session. So I won't yeah, talk, talk about it uh, right now, uh, especially because it's not commonly used by ransomware. It's more used by get efficient. So, yeah. so here's an example of how an app uh, tracks foreground app, uh, you can see in the line 48 that the app actually gets, uh, it calls get running tasks and extract top activity uh, and package name uh, for the foreground app. And whenever it's not, uh, like the foreground app is not equal to uh, this app, uh, this app's package name, uh, it will start its own main activity. You can see it in line. 53, 51, 50, uh, 56, and it also will try to um, kill the ground activity, the app, the, whenever the app was, whatever the app was uh, in foreground before uh, 957. Uh, so in general, that's kind of it. Uh, that's the easiest way uh, for ransomware to do that. However, um, there's also another interesting feature being abused by ransomware. Uh, so system alert window permission uh, allows an app to create a sticky view. Um, so by sticky view, um, that's um, an easiest example of sticky view is uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, so whenever you uh, leave the Facebook Messenger, it will create a small bubble that will be with you until you actually will try to close it. So it will be all over other apps. So if you even like uh, decided to start other apps, uh, decided, decided to start using other apps, this uh, bubble from Facebook Messenger will be still on top uh, of, of other apps. So in some Android versions, uh, system alert window permission allows the app to create um, other ways to create these like, sticky views that were even shown over system UIs, including uh, status bar notification and, for example, the dialogue uh, to turn off the device. 
Uh, and here's an example. Uh, in this screenshot, you can see that uh, the window, uh, like the ransomware uh, activity, is over like every single device. It's over even um, status bar notification. Uh, notification bar. So um, yeah, that's how they achieve it. They actually abuse system under window permission and create uh, a view with light params uh, for one of these types. They actually uh, some more types, most of these types are already depreciated, uh, but yeah. Um, if there is apps actually target them like older versions of Android, they may use it and it will work. And here is an example of uh, how it works. So the app needs to create a view. Uh, then they need to create live runs with uh, this type. In this example, they use a type system alert or type DOS. Uh, this um, types allows an app to overview uh, all system dialogs. And then they need add params to the view and start this view. So that's basically it. Uh, in, in this case, they don't even need to track uh, a foreground app anymore. So that's it uh, for ransomware. And yeah, ready for example. So if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them now or when we will go through examples. So, okay, let's go to examples. Uh, I shared this uh, file uh, with you. I think they should be available. Um, yeah, we'll start with this uh, chihu.dk. And here it is. Uh, so that's JEDX. And let's go to Android manifest for the app. Um, here we can see that they have actually declared system on their permission, uh, but that's, not what we are actually interested in here. And here it is. Uh, so the app uh, declares receiver for bind uh, for device admin enabled uh, intent uh, with bind device admin permission. Uh, and links uh, XML file um, for device admin policy. So let's go to Yes, XML, and here is this file. So we can see that the app can uh, limit password, reset password. So actually, limit password uh, is that this policy allows the app to set some limits for the password. We, I, I don't consider this dangerous policy. We don't actually care about that. But most important, these two policies: reset password and force log. So, and it should be um, implemented in, so uh, device admin receiver is dot .sb class. Let's go to this uh, class in source code, in source code. So the package name of the app is uh, com.chihu.security. And we can see anything like that. We can see only uh, our class under that. And the reason for that is that the app is actually packed uh, with packets. So I um, also shared with you decrypted this file. Uh, it's called stopdex. Let's take a look at this file. Security. Uh, and here we can see that device admin receiver is actually uh, an empty class. So it means that the app won't abuse uh, cases when the user is trying to uh, disable device admin from the app. Uh, but anyway, it still is able to use uh, device admin because um, yeah, it declares it manifest and you just need to ask the user, uh, uh, yeah, you just need to ask the user to enable uh, this. So we can search for, uh, we saw in uh, policy 
XML that the app is capable to reset the password. So let's search for reset password method, and we can see that it's been called from two places. Let's go to the first one. Um, yeah. So we can see that the app tries to, in this method, the app tries to like, ask the user to enable a uh, device administrator for the app. And whenever the device administrator was enabled for the app, the app will immediately reset the password to this value. Let's search for usage, and we can see that it's some hard coded value and it won't change. So it's, it's just hard coded constant. Uh, and what will happen next? So, uh, yeah, first of all, let's check what happened with this method before, uh, where it will be called from. So, two places. So the app will create uh, other dialog with two buttons, a uh, negative button and positive button. So the thing is, uh, it's like yes button, no button, and it doesn't matter what the user will actually click on. Uh, from both on clicks, the app will call uh, this PM method, which will reset the password. Um, and then it will start uh, this activity. Let's go to that report and search for on create. Uh, yeah. So it will create some activity. And the interesting thing about this activity, it also implements on key down, um, on key down uh, callback. So yeah, uh, which will be triggered by uh, like the user is trying to uh, press some case. And it doesn't matter what the user will actually press. Here you can see like, uh, this. It, in all cases, it will start the SG activity and call SP. Uh, let's go to SP, first of all, and SP, the only thing that it's doing, it will call log now. So it will send the user to the log screen where the user will find out that uh, they know they don't know uh, the password for the device anymore. And to ask for the demand, they will call this method. So that's actually a very interesting case because they do not directly call the, call the method, they use reflection. Uh, and that's kind of clever technique because uh, it will go to this SG method and search for usage. We probably, yeah, we won't find anything. So if we're already here and trying to find places where the app is using it, uh, we won't find any right because of the reflection. So here the interesting thing, uh, it's on create method. So the app will actually enable audio uh, for the app, uh, like enable take audio, like enable volume uh, for the device, and then it will, yeah, open uh, some media file from its assets folder and play it in the loop. So it actually has other capabilities uh, for us, uh, the user uh, to pay the ransom, but yeah, it's um, that's one of them. Uh, so it will be great if you find some time goes through this app. It's not a big app, it has just a few classes, and discover all other ways it asks uh, the user for the ransom. And we will go to the next app, the next app that I wanted to show you. And let's be uh, encrypt. So we'll go to the mining test. Uh, we won't see a lot of, like, we'll see some 
interesting for me some like recontact, send SMS, receive SMS and so on. But we're actually interested in uh, read external storage and write external storage. Uh, so let's um, find a place where they've been used. Uh, we need to go to um, like the main entry point of the app. Splash. So here it is. Uh, that's really interesting. Let's take a look what's happening here. So we won't go to this um, to this methods and details, but based on their names, we can understand that the app is actually trying to get IP address and run who is probably on that IP address. And for the uh, IP address, it checks if it belongs to Google or not. So if it's not, if it's part of Google, uh, it will show this message. Otherwise, it will uh, call the set connection async method. So it's a simple clocking, uh, yet very interesting. Let's go here. And yeah, so on post from, yeah, from on post execute, it will start Tesla activity. So Tesla activity, what's interesting about Tesla activity? Uh, what it will do? So it sets uh, encryption, encryption and decryption methods. And then show content. Yeah, interesting method prepare local VTC price. Uh, that's something that, yeah. So we actually need to go to register method. And here's, here it is. So the app actually collects some information on the device and posts it to, uh, to C2. And it may receive response, JSON, JSON object. Uh, response of C2. So it extracts some data from it. Uh, the secret um, will be sent to the care class, we'll go later to that. And the care class will be executed only if the C was one. No, we're actually uh, not really interested in other things, but uh, just want to mention that this uh, depth address, it, as you can see, it uh, no, it will so in different, yeah, in different place. But if you'll track uh, this depth address in the app, you'll find something interesting too. So it's just you need to go to a different class. Anyway, we're interested in uh, what's happening with this secret. And to be sent to care class. Let's go to definition care. And from on the ground, it will call. Uh, sacrifice victim files method for the first parameter will be easy cards and the second parameter that say secret received from from C2. Let's go. And here it is. Uh, the list of files in directory and the directory will be easy card. Uh, so they will check extension uh, of the file name. Let's check these extensions. It is to back. I can give the open engine, yeah. And if the file extension is part of this list, it will encrypt file, delete it, and go recursively through other apps. Um, and here, here it is. Uh, they use cipher, write files. That's it. So this is for encrypt is actually pretty simple. And um, yeah, if you want, you can actually, so it will be great if you uh, will find some time and find uh, two things. What happening with uh, that, um, let me show you, not here, not here. From, Okay. 
uh, what happened with that address, uh, first of all. And the second thing, uh, it would be great uh, to find out how the app actually shows the demand to the user, what, what will it tell uh, to the user. And third example that I found actually very interesting, it's, uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go to this class. So we will go to manifest. We'll see that the app actually declares tons of permissions, like literally almost every possible permission. And it's really hard to start analyzing the app and to find out um, where the things happening, patterns happening. So usually when I'm finding something like this, I'm paying attention to uh, some more dangerous permissions. For example, in this case, it will be read SMS and so on. But in this case, we are not interested, interested in this permission. We actually want to find out uh, where the app creates um, flat around. So let's situate it. I need mean, to wait some time. Well, it becomes silent. So, yeah, uh, we need to find uh, the place where the app creates like brands, and we found. Uh, like, 500, more than 500 users like that. So going through this, all these classes, we actually can kind of exclude them because they look legit. And we are interested in something that happened with this app. We're interested actually here. So that's that's the place. So the app uh, will create a web view, and uh, for that web view, it will create uh, platforms for types, uh, system doors, and uh, system window. As far as I remember, uh, then it will add these params to the web view and load local file from the yeah uh, local file from SSD folder. Uh, that web view. So it actually has uh, some JavaScript methods, the JavaScript interfaces that will be accessible from the index file. Um, but yeah, let's, so this, this will be kind of a sticky view, a view that will be on top of other apps and so on. So let's check the file. And here it is. All personal data from your smartphone has been transferred to a secure cloud. It contains and the data that exists. So in less than 72 hours, this data will be sent to every person from your telephone uh, and email contact list. Uh, towards the section, you have to pay a modest ransom of fifty dollars. So that's uh, that's actually it. It's pretty crazy how easy they can do it. Uh, but the funny thing about this app, if you try to search for usage for this app activity, you find uh, you, you will find nothing except for um, like internal from the same class. Uh, all references to this class uh, actually exist only this class too. So it will go to Android manifest and search for add. Activity. So that's the run of activity, we need the next one, and here it is. So it just listed as an activity, but it won't be distributed from the manifest tool. And that's another question that uh, I have for you. It would be great if you find out the way this activity is being triggered or executed. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I actually shared a few more examples. Uh, we didn't go through study.dpk, uh, but it's pretty simple and 
yeah, it's, it's a good example of uh, our latest. Uh, and I also shared the example uh, API R dot APK. Uh, that's the one from this screenshot. It's a really great example. Unfortunately, it's not been compiled properly in JADEX, so that's and it's slightly obfuscated. So that makes uh, it hard to review and like, kind of a bad example for the training, but a good uh, like, sample for your free time to go through it. That's, that's it from my side. Uh, I li love this walkthrough of how you analyze the uh, code in various uh, different uh, APKs. This is fantastic. Uh, let me throw the floor open for questions from members of the audience. Hello, uh, this is Sebastian again. While we all wait for questions, I uh, want to mention that we actually we made samples available to you. So you can actually um, download them and work with them hands on. And uh, as soon as I figured out how to start a chat window here again, I'll do that. Because um, I've got a link for you. I, uh, I clicked certain buttons on my on my uh, on my uh, Zoom that uh, disabled the chat. I'm sure I'll figure it out. In the meantime, in the meantime, um, please um, ask questions, and I'll post the download um, the download link in the chat. And uh, Roman, you can also say what um, what they can expect from that download link. Uh, so yeah, there will be uh, these files. So you can see names. Uh, so they will be under these names. Like Jikudu, the APK, and so on. Uh, and I also, yeah, uh, provide you SHA-256 badges for the steps, so you can actually check if, uh, if everything is correct as the steps. Great, so as soon as we get that link, you know, I think some of the students can start downloading it. Um, what about questions from, uh, the, from the call? I, I have a question. Hi, Roman. Uh, uh, this is really insightful, I have to say. I mean, the, the whole, I mean, the walkthrough of the flow is really good. Uh, but my question is like this here. I mean, here, the examples you show are, I mean, we say maybe there are some simple APKs. How, how do we define simple? Just I define simple like the code. Maybe there's no, no heavy obfuscation techniques applied to the APKs, right? So maybe from the chihu.apk's example, you can see, I mean, the some of the files, the name are meaningless, right? But the source code are still readable, right? So you can you can find some key factors to define whether they are the ransomware or some other kind of malware. Uh, maybe, I mean, I also know that for the manifest file, I mean, they cannot be obfuscated. So maybe you can still find some valuable information there. But, I mean, we know that in the modern cases, I mean, the developers always use some heavy obfuscation skills. Like maybe I just get to know, it, it, please correct me if I'm wrong. So maybe some API reflection or some other encryption. So maybe it will make the source code very hard to read or even you cannot find anything inside it. So this, this kind of cases, do you still have any kind of other technology to find some other key factors to define, oh, okay, this is ransomware, or oh, okay, this is spyware, because maybe spyware or routing malware, they also want to steal your privilege, steal your administrative, so like this. So that's, that's my question. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a great question, and I had, uh, so I forget to answer it during, uh, I, I actually thought that I should answer it during the presentation, actually, in the beginning of the presentation. So the best way to analyze the ransomware, it's actually installed on your like, uh, emulator or on your test uh, device, and most likely, 90% of cases, you will see it will, it will lock you out of the device as soon as possible. Like it will start to encrypt your files like as soon as possible. 
So in most cases, the easiest way to analyze ransomware is just to run it on your device. But like, it definitely should be the device that you don't care about. And also the another thing, uh, it, it, it's usually a good idea to have rooted device uh, for the um, for the ransomware because it's the easiest way to remove uh, ransomware app from your device. Thank you. Perfect. I have the questions. I haven't yeah. been able to uh, find the chat. Is it maybe disabled? We yes, and you can enable the you chat. Know, uh, it's a good question. Uh, did um, I'm looking for the chat as well. Um, the I, I think the chat is no longer available in Zoom in this version. Really? I, 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 I think so. I tried to talk with someone, but I didn't find it either. Yeah. Um, we, we will look at it over the break. How's that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Bill, um, I think this is uh, a comment for you. If you can take a look and see whether the settings uh, that we use to set up this call are such that chat has been disabled, then uh, if, it, if that's the case, then maybe we can re-enable it after the break. Yeah, so. I just chatted, I just chatted with Prashant about that and we're gonna take a look at that at the break. Great, thank you. So again, uh, let's, uh, I think we're, thanks to Roman, we're exactly on time for the break. Uh, I know our friends in Google and in California are ready for lunch. And in fact, I'm going to go grab some lunch too. It's a little late for me, but uh, we'll see everybody back at 4 p.m. Eastern, uh, 1 Pacific, uh, to spend the rest of the afternoon uh, with Roman. One thing, Sebastian and Roman, that might be helpful is we have the lab at the end of the day, and perhaps at the beginning of the next session, it might be worth saying a few words on how you see the lab going. Right. Uh, if that, if does that make sense? Just so. Awesome. Okay, thanks everyone. See you all in a bit. Welcome back everyone. We're gonna have uh, two more sessions this afternoon uh, of talks and uh, both by Roman Unicek. And he's first gonna talk about uh, accessibility API abuse. So all yours, over to you, Roman. Thank you. Uh, so welcome uh, everyone back. Uh, welcome to the accessibility abuse uh, session. Uh, so, uh, a few things about accessibility abuse. Um, I mentioned it uh, when I talked about ransomware, and I will mention it when I will talk about phishing. So, accessibility abuse, it's not some kind of like, um, behavior that happens only in one kind of malware. It's uh, like something that can be abused by different um, like different malware apps, different malicious apps. Um, so that's why uh, yeah, uh, I decided to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and here is our agenda. Uh, so in the beginning, we'll quickly go through accessibility service overview. Then we will discover signals on how we can detect if the app is using accessibility. And then we'll go through major reasons for accessibility abuse, like keylogger, monitoring for grant apps, install apps, and grant permissions. Uh, so, yeah, and, in, and after that, we'll go uh, again to the JEDEX, and I will show you some examples of how apps, how malicious apps, not only malicious apps, how apps in general abuse accessibility. So let's start with accessibility service. Uh, here's uh, some information on accessibility from developer.android.com. Uh, so an accessibility service, it's an app uh, that provides user interface adjustments uh, to assist uh, users with disabilities or who may temporarily be unable to fully interact with the device. Uh, for example, like people who are driving uh, or doing something else, uh, something another, uh, like another thing that they can't actually use their device. Uh, so there are some standard, uh, standard built into Android accessibility services, uh, but developers can actually create and distribute their own 
at civility services. Uh, so in general, like civility is a set of API uh, that can be used by any regular app, um, just like a part of an app. So the app may have, uh, the app in general may use any other Android API. It may uh, do different things, but part of this app uh, may implement Android, ser uh, Android civility service and use Accessibility API. Uh, so what's actually accessibility? Uh, so apps with accessibility service can have a full visibility over different UI events on the device, both from system and third party apps. Uh, so the app may receive any, uh, may receive notification about any new UI event. For example, the user clicked on some button, user opened, um, user opened like a new app or something like, something another changed. So all of this, uh, everything that is visible to the users that is visible through like a uh, uh, device is actually part of accessibility service and available uh, to the app that implements accessibility service. Uh, when the app with accessibility service receives uh, such accessibility event, it can uh, get package name of the app that produce that UI event, and it can list all UI elements from uh, from the current UI, like uh, buttons, everything else, like text views, I don't know, like image views, like everything. Uh, and it also can extract text. Uh, furthermore, the app uh, with disability can um, interfere with other apps. Uh, it can generate uh, events that for the target app will look exactly like user generated events. So it can click on the app, click on like any UI element, it can scroll and so on. It also can generate like system level events uh, like um, emulate uh, home button or like back button. So whenever, so it can actually like uh, send user to the home screen of the device, things like that. So that's very powerful set of uh, set of methods. It's, yeah, very powerful API. Um, yeah, let's take a look uh, how we can detect if the app is actually using disability. Uh, so every app with disability service must uh, must declare disability service in the manifest. Uh, to do that, it needs to create some service um, with uh, intent filter for action Android don't disability service dot disability service. And it, uh, they need also to declare permission for that service uh, by disability service. Uh, this permission means that only like system app can uh, only system can actually like bind accessibility for the device. Um, yeah, uh, another interesting thing can, uh, in this uh, code snippet in this uh, like XML uh, part of XML, uh, the string that starts with metadata, Android name, and so on. And uh, in the end, you can see Android resource XML, and then uh, accessibility service config. So that's actually an XML file with some configuration for accessibility, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, so also another thing about accessibility service, uh, so the app need to create accessibility service class. You can see it listed uh, in the first line, it's com radio world club accessibility service. And this class uh, must extend android.accessibility service, accessibility service class. Uh, in order to receive accessibility events. So let's talk a little bit about configuration. Uh, so the app can actually configure which events from which apps it want to receive. Uh, for example, it can filter out, so if the app is interested only in UI events from one specific app, it can filter out every other apps and just like, uh, set a list of apps that it's interested in. Uh, and it, it can also 
filter out all uninteresting events for it. So there are like a number of different events. Um, so yeah, uh, they can do it in two ways. Uh, first of all, the app can list them in XML file, which will be stored in the REST XML and referenced in Android manifest. And here you can see um, content of one of these files. So the most important uh, fields here is accessibility event types. Uh, so here you can see list of accessibility event types that um, the app is interested in. And uh, we can see also that another important thing uh, can retrieve window content set to true. It means that the app can actually extract text from other apps. And we don't see, we, we, there is no uh, filter for package names. So it means that the app will receive notifications from uh, every, uh, from every app on the device, including system apps. Uh, so another way to uh, set these filters, uh, configure accessibility service, uh, the app can call set service info method in runtime and basically like set uh, similar filters and uh, values. Yep, so that's it about configuration and for accessibility. So uh, it is not enough to do, uh, it's not enough to declare accessibility in manifest and create a special class in, in the app. The app need also to ask user to enable accessibility for the app. So here you can see, and uh, it can be done only through um, like the settings app, um, it looks like uh, on the screenshot. So the, to open this UI, the app needs to start activity point and android.settings dot accessibility settings. And uh, then the user will see uh, such UI and the user will need to like enable accessibility for this specific app. Um, and whenever they, so here you can see that actually many different apps are listed. So the user need to like find the specific app, enable it, and it won't be enabled by default. So the user will see additional dialogue uh, telling them uh, what actually the app will be able to do. So in this example, it's pretty obvious that like, some fake flash player app is trying to get access to accessibility and it will be able to view and control screen and view and perform action against other apps. So it's probably a good idea not to allow accessibility service for such app. So yeah, uh, as soon as user will uh, allow an app uh, to accessibility, uh, the app will actually have control over the whole UI on the device. Um, and that's, that's really powerful. So yeah, how this control is happening. Uh, so the app needs to implement Android. Uh, so as I said earlier here, um, accessibility service class in the app must extend Android.accessibility service class. Uh, and it means that the app need to implement on accessibility event callback in that class. It will be triggered, like executed every time uh, the system has new UI event, new accessibility event. Uh, so for every new change in UI, this method will be called, this callback will be called. And uh, <clears throat> they will be able to get accessibility event and analyze it and do something with the app. So that's the main entry point for abuse analysis. Whenever I'm analyzing uh, accessibility abuse, I'm going directly to that method. There is no reason, to, so uh, there are actually uh, some reason to analyze other methods, uh, but like that's, that's where all accessibility events are going in. Uh, if the app want to do any actions against other apps, if the app want to extract text, if the, if the app want to like click on other apps, they will ha the app will have to do it 
from on disability event. Maybe not directly, maybe through some cold chain. But anyway, you will find this behavior uh, while analyzing uh, on disability event callback. So that's the main entry point and the most important thing uh, when analyzing disability abuse. Uh, for example, in this case, we can see that uh, the app will get a uh, package name uh, from the disability event. So it, it will, uh, so first of all, in the line 381, it will get event type uh, and if event type 32, if I remember correctly, event type 32, it's like window changed, then it will uh, get package name uh, for the app that produce event and we'll uh, compare it with like some substrings, uh, for example, package installer and so on and do some things against that. So, yeah. Uh, what app? can actually do uh, with this accessibility event. Uh, so they can collect some data. Uh, first of all, they can collect some data from, uh, from the accessibility event, from the app that produced accessibility event. Uh, they can, uh, the app can get package name uh, for the app that produced event. The app can get um, event type. For example, Windows change active. Uh, it means that, um, new event produced uh, some, something changed in active like window <clears throat> another interesting event type window content changed that this event usually generated when the user is typing something in the like text box but not only that uh, and you can find more events uh, with the link on uh, developer uh, android on developers.android.com um, another method, so the app can actually, um, the app with stability service can actually uh, kind of extract UI elements from the whole UI that produced UI event, that produced stability event. So it can search uh, for specific uh, UI elements uh, and there are two like, main major methods to do that. They, it can search by text or it can search by ID. So here's an example of simple ID, Android ID button man. It's generic um, ID for, for button, just regular button. Uh, and so if the app want to extract, uh, want to find all buttons, for example, or like to, in this case, it will find the first button. Um, from the UI and click on it. Uh, they, the app will use find stability uh, node infos by view ID. And if the app, for example, wants to find all buttons with OK text, then it would call find stability node infos by text uh, for text OK. And then it will have a list of UIs that contains uh, OK text. So, yeah. Um, next method, get text. Uh, so this method allows the app to extract text from the specific uh, accessibility node. So, yeah. Uh, for example, yeah. So, so from specific accessibility node or yeah, accessibility event. So this uh, this actually the whole the, the all methods that allow an app, accessibility, an app with accessibility service uh, to extract some data from uh, from other apps. Not 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 actually all, but this is a major method. Most malware actually use uh, this method. And yeah, that's it. And for methods that can that allows an app to send events against other apps or like against system, there are actually uh, just two methods. Um, mostly used by malware. Perform action. Uh, this method allows an app to generate some event against other app. The most common um, valor for perform action is action click with value 16. It, it just generates click against some uh, UI element. Uh, they can also like uh, use action long click, action copy, and many more different events. You can find some of the link. 
and performed global action, it actually generates system level event. Uh, so the app can generate event like lock screen, I mean, like send uh, the user to the lock screen. Uh, it can, so lo lo lock the device. It can uh, send the user back to the home screen uh, of the device. It can uh, simulate uh, system a button back. It can take screenshot and so on. So it's it's very powerful uh, method and it's been abused by malware. So you can find more actions uh, by, by the link. And yeah, let's go. So that's, that's actually um, all about uh, accessibility. So that's all, all details that you need to know when you're analyzing uh, accessibility abuse. And not actually a lot, just like a few screens of uh, APIs and like uh, XML strings. Uh, but if whenever you become like uh, more familiar with them, it's so easy to like uh, read an app uh, using this uh, method. So uh, like just like a few methods uh, that allow an app to do basically everything on the device and yeah. So reasons for abuse, of course, uh, it's ability abuse, it's a very powerful set of uh, API and uh, it's been abused by malware. So yeah, let's take a look at that. Um, and first of all, Keylogger. Um, yeah, so I did a quick search, uh, Google search and find a few open source project that allows you like to implement um, K-logger behavior based on um, based on stability service. And um, of course, it's something that's commonly used by malware. But uh, in opposite to like a regular K-logger, uh, the app with stability doesn't have to lock every keyboard stroke. The app can extract text for text change to events and like um, it just can extract already typed text. So it doesn't need to actually monitor for um, which exact keyboard button the user pressed and like lock them all. It, it will have visibility over enter text even if the enter text was uh, entered into password field. So, I mean, it may be not visible for the users, but it will, it, it still will be usable uh, for, for an app with uh, accessibility service. Uh, so here's an example of an app that is doing like keyloggers. I mean, it steals entered text from, um, from, um, uh, from an app and interesting to think about that that um, it's not only still in enter text it's also trying to make screenshots of the keyboard so here you can see that in the line uh, 286 uh, it checks if uh, the app that produced uh, UI element is a keyboard app and then it will send a broadcast to a different part of the app that will uh, create a screenshot at that point. So um, I don't know why exactly they need it, but I think that um, they wasn't sure how it will actually work on the users, uh, on the user devices. So they uh, try to collect all enter data uh, through accessibility, but they also generated uh, screenshots. Uh, so they, uh, would be able to compare uh, all this data on their side. So in the end, uh, the app will combine all entry text and send it back to the server and will go, will probably go through this app uh, uh, in the end of the presentation. Another way to, another reason uh, for accessibility abuse, uh, it's done mostly by efficient apps, but it can be done like, by ransomware apps too. Um, this app, uh, so this malware can use accessibility to track the foreground app. So it allows them 
Accessibility service allows them to do lots of different things. And why do they need to uh, like ask user to grant additional uh, like access and uh, disturb user additional time if they can do all the things just from the accessibility? So some of Fission apps are actually using accessibility service not only for other types of abuse, but uh, to track for uh, foreground apps. So in this example, in this um, quote, we can see that uh, from onsability event callback, uh, the app generates a list of like, keywords. And if the package name of the app that produced onsability event contains one of these words, so it's obviously something like Facebook, Instagram, or other apps, um, the app will start its own fission activity to overlay uh, the target app. Uh, so another way, um, another reason of accessibility abuse is to silent, uh, silently install apps. So uh, basically like every app on Android can download and install additional APK but uh, the user will be notified about that and the user should allow this installation. The user will have to go through uh, package install UI and like um, allow this installation, launch the app and so on. Uh, however, with accessibility, they can send uh, events, uh, especially like perf with perform action, 16, it generates click against the uh, package installer app. And uh, by doing that, uh, the app can actually like silently uh, install the app and launch it. Um, and yeah, most of these apps uh, are using uh, this UI IDs to find uh, proper uh, buttons uh, to send uh, click against. So, yeah. And um, yeah, uh, these apps can, uh, abusive apps can generate uh, events not only against um, package installer, but against other system apps uh, like settings app, for example. So uh, some apps actually monitor if uh, a settings app uh, is in foreground and the current activity has names like grant permission activity, manager, uh, manage permissions activity, SMS default dialog, device admin add. And uh, by doing that, they can actually understand if, uh, uh, if the user was asked to grant uh, access to permissions or like, if the user was asked to uh, enable the app as default SMS app or enable device admin for the app. So, uh, but doing that, they can actually uh, like grant themselves uh, permissions. I mean, uh, from one point of code, they can ask user uh, to grant them necessary permissions. So the system UI, the, like the, uh, the settings app, uh, will be in foreground. And from the other part of the code, the app will receive a notification that system, uh, that the settings app in foreground and it's like necessary activities. So after that, they start in clicking on like okay buttons or like hello and so on. Another way to, another reason for app to abuse uh, accessibility uh, is to gain some um, persistent, persistence on the device. So the app can prevent user from revoking permissions or from installing the app. Uh, so they can actually, uh, monitor uh, for like package installer app and settings app again. And whenever they think that something wrong is going on, uh, they can send global action one. It will uh, simulate go back like button. Or they can send global action two and the user will be sent to the home screen of the device. Um, so it's pretty simple behavior and yet very powerful. So that's actually uh, all the like, theory that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and we'll go to examples, but if you have any questions before we'll go to examples, feel free to ask them. Okay, let's take a look uh, at a few apps. So yeah, 
I will use uh, Jadex again and again I'm using unstable version of Jadex because it's uh, it's easier. Yeah, so that's keylogger.apk and yeah, let me show you Android manifest file. So it's actually a pretty big file with lots of permissions. Some of them are actually kind of suspicious, but we don't care right now about them. Um, here we can see that the app also uses uh, device admin, um, but the most important thing it's here. So the app um, implements uh, accessibility service. Uh, so we can see action, accessibility service, accessibility service, uh, and then filter for like an permission for that class. So uh, we actually need to find this class in the APK. Um, but before that, uh, let's check that XML file. We need to go S XML, and that's it. So here we can see that the app is actually interested list of accessibility events. And the list is pretty big. So I think that the app is basically interested in all available events. And yeah, I don't see any filter uh, for package names. And it also can retrieve it, uh, can retrieve window content. It means that the app can extract text um, from other apps. Uh, so yeah, we need to go to that class, but it's all pretty big. And usually, when I want to uh, analyze accessibility views, I just go directly to on accessibility event callback. So anyway, it will be the same class, but we don't need to search uh, for this like obfuscated methods and so on. Um, yeah, let's start taking a quick look. So uh, the app is like, I can't say that it's obfuscated, but anyway. Uh, so here's accessibility event. That's the like most important thing about all of that. So uh, accessibility event will contain all necessary data. Uh, let's take a look on what's happening here. And here for accessibility event, uh, the app will extract text. So let's rename it to get hmm. That's interesting. I can't. Oh, they renamed everything back. Okay. Oh, anyway. That's, let's rename that to So this method will actually extract uh, text from accessibility event and uh, return that string. Let's go back to accessibility event. And here we can see it. So let's rename. And I can rename it. Interesting. Okay, can I rename this? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't rem rename everything I wanted, but yeah, that's okay. Uh, so here's the text uh, from the accessibility event. Uh, let's take a look what happen what will happen with that uh, text later. So in this, uh, so it will combine uh, this text into this value. And later, later, if it's not zero, it will actually put this text, uh, saying that it's k log, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so it will actually like upload it as a JSON object to the server. So here you can see that 
it actually also analyzed if the event somehow been um, uh, related to different keyboards. It's actually not, not necessary. So all of they actually need to do is to get text from, uh, from the civility event and uh, yeah, uh, upload it. But in this case, they actually want uh, to be sure that it was produced by one of these apps and they have different uh, ways to do that. And they also like send intents to different parts of the app to generate, um, to, generate uh, to, to like, make screenshots. Uh, another important thing, so it's still the same method. And here, um, what I want to share, yeah. So yeah, in this part, so format. So format, it's a class name for, from the civility event. Uh, format two will be uh, civility event type. So here it is. Uh, this will be a format uh, will be a class name, format two, accessibility event type, format three, uh, package name. So what's happening here later with that format? Uh, so they compare uh, format like class name with this thing. So uh, that's the setting that manage default uh, apps activity. Uh, that's the settings for a check for default SMS app. Uh, that's for enabling like or changing default SMS app. It's just a regular dialogue. Uh, it's a class name for um, adding device uh, enabling device admin for an app and like. You can see lots of interesting class names happening here. And so what will happen next? So for this C, uh, they will assign different values for that C. And they can actually do different things for, for this C, right? Um, in some cases, they send uh, global action one, to, so going back. Um, in some cases, let's see, I think, yeah, oh, we need to find clicks. So, yeah. Uh, the thing about this app, it has lots of different classes and have lots of different um, IDs. And yeah, so by carefully tracking what happening uh, with every uh, what happening with every uh, <coughs> UI ID and for like against every class name, you can actually find out uh, that the app. Uh, grants itself additional permissions, enables everything like they wanted for it, and yeah, this method. So if you go to this method, it sends well, this string here. Um, let's go to the declaration, the string. So um, this method will go through, so it will find stability node in the uh, node infos by view ID for that specific uh, the specific uh, string ID and uh, call perform action 16 against uh, against that method and perform action 16 it's actually click so whenever the app um, So whenever the app is trying to like, call this method, it's actually um, some clicks against this UI element. 
Yeah, that's it. Uh, so that's, that's a huge example. And I think it will be interesting to go through uh, this app in details and check what actually happened against uh, every class name. But uh, in general, I provided you some overview with like interesting methods and yeah. So for other examples, yeah, let's check. Uh, check and start the okay. So that's actually a huge file. And that's that's a legit app. So that's not malware. Uh, it's a legit app that uses its ability to silently install apps. So um, they have kind of reason to do that, uh, but it's still it's ability abuse, I would say. Yeah, that's very big app, so we need to wait some time before it will be fully decompiled. Almost there. So about other examples. Uh, so we didn't check this example, so it's a packet app, and here's unpacked, um, think, uh, unpacked jar file that actually contains accessibility abuse. And additional example that uh, you might want to take a look at, it's uh, uh, bread.apk. Um, I think that it's kind of not really hard, but it's not easy to review the app because again, uh, Jadex and Dex to Jar fails to uh, fail to decompile it properly, so you will have some problems uh, reviewing it. But other than that, it's really great app. It's pretty simple. It don't have a lot of uh, like different methods and so on. And uh, the most interesting thing about that app it's how they uh, implemented everything. So I think it worth checking out. And Anubis APK, it's infamous Anubis. Uh, Fission app, Fission PHA, and uh, yeah, uh, it, it's hard because it's obfuscated, packed, and so on. Uh, but uh, it's it's really a great example of uh, accessibility abuse. So let's go back to that app and search for um, ability event. Here it is. So what next? Yep. Here it is. So if uh, so, uh, the app will send its ability event to this uh, method, and if is decay more than like at least eighteen or more, uh, then this method will be called. Let's. Let's check it. So what will happen here? Uh, the app um, the app will try to uh, find accessibility not by D for like every from this list uh, for, for every element for this list. Uh, the app will try to find uh, accessibility not, which is like kind of QI element. And it will send it here. Let's check it. Yeah, and it will try to click on that element. And let's check this list. And the list is package installer OK button, package installer done button, uh, and other um, package installer. So it's uh, from my UI. Uh, yeah, the same, okay, button, done button. Yeah, so from different package installers, uh, button that actually installs an app. So, yeah. Um, and the third example is 
brief brief escalate app so let's search let's check that manifest uh, here you can see it's in this pilot uh, search for accessibility here it is so this class uh, implements accessibility let's search for And we can't find nothing because the app is actually packed. Uh, and we have unpacked file, previous to char. There it is. Um, yeah. So this app is actually tracks for like. Um, so it's tier two, it's class name. So it checks if um, um, the new event is coming from the class that contains uh, permission activity, uh, grant permission activity, and then it tries to click on that again. So that's it's pretty simple and yeah. It's actually uh, doing different things against other apps, against uh, I mean different interesting things. And it also, uh, here it is. So it also tracks for, yeah, uh, let me. So Easter is, it's a package name for the UI, uh, for the like uh, accessibility event, for the apps that produced accessibility event. And then it checks if uh, this uh, package name contains actually some substring. And in this case, it will do something. Let's check uh, what it will do. And it will start activity. Some activity looks like over uh, that app. So let's, let's quickly check um that list of substrings and here it is so the app will actually search for facebook instagram whatsapp chrome and other these apps and try to overlap them with their own like, ui start activity over these apps and um, yeah if you spend some time going through this app understanding uh what happened here so you will actually find out that uh, it will open some url um, which is actually like fishing URL over this app. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's all examples that I wanted to show you for accessibility views. Any questions? Thank you, Roman. So again, you know, very insightful. Appreciate your explaining all this to us. So questions from uh, the audience? As usual, please unmute and ask. All right. So I think, you know, my guess, Roman, is that um, uh, with about four hours of lectures this afternoon. People are getting a little. Uh, yeah. So maybe it's a good time to take a break. We have plenty of time in the lab session, I imagine, to also mm -hmm. have discussions. Yeah. So let's take about 10 minute break, give people a few minutes to stretch their legs, give you a chance also to uh, get some coffee or tea mm -hmm. or something. And um, we'll reconvene at five o'clock in okay. two o'clock Pacific. Thanks so much and see you all in a few minutes. So welcome back everyone. And uh, Roman will take us through uh, uh, phishing uh, in the Android platform next. And then we'll have a lab. Actually, before we start, Sebastian or Roman, would you like to say a few words about how the lab will be done? Not a lab. We just figured 
we're going to give people the opportunity to explore the samples that we're sharing as part of the uh, presentations today. And um, if there are any questions, we're going to hang around for an hour, happy to walk you through the samples, assist with technical problems and so on. But ultimately, it's self-guided by the students. Um, okay. Whatever they want. Excellent. All right, great. So, Roman, back to you. Thank you, Sebastian. So. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome back. Uh, welcome to the uh, training on Android Fishing. So, here's uh, our agenda for this training session. We'll start with definition um, that's used by Android security team. And uh, then we go through techniques. Um, so, Fission techniques uh, mainly fall into two baskets. One of them is credential theft, another is like OTP theft, one-time password theft. So we'll go through uh, major techniques used uh, both for like credential theft and then for OTP theft. And in the end, we'll check some examples. Uh, you will have some time for that, hopefully have, okay? Um, Let's start this definition of phishing. You can find this definition on developers.google.com. That's our official uh, definition of phishing. So code that pretends uh, to come from a trustworthy source requests a user's authentication credentials of billing information and send the data to a third party server, so to a third party. Uh, this category also applies to code that intercepts the transmission of user credential in transit. So um, usually it sounds like credentials for some app. It can be like bank app or social media app. So most of the apps are actually interested in like credentials for social media or bank apps, or it can be credit card uh, details. Uh, so whenever we found an app that collects this data, extracts some of the data, and sends them to some third party server. Um, yeah, we flag it as phishing. Uh, so that actually a special case of phishing uh, is when an app uh, abusing SMS or like phone banking. Uh, so let me, uh, yeah, let me a little bit explain. So some banks introduced SMS banking as uh, a service that allows you to check uh, your, like, for example, balance uh, through SMS. Uh, and a few banks actually went even further and they allows the users to make bank transactions through SMS. So the user of this bank actually needs to send uh, an SMS to, uh, to the bank number uh, with the amount of money and the new like account number where they want to transfer them. And that's like, that sounds scary. And they have huge, uh, they, they have some um, like limits. Uh, I, I think that no more than $100 can be transferred uh, daily, but still, you know, it's like, it's so easy to do. And um, yeah, so of course it, it's, it was, uh, um, it was abused by malware. And another thing that we also track as phishing is intercept of OTPs. So whenever we know that the app is actually hunting for one-time passwords, it may, it may even not like trying to steal credentials because it's part of uh, a bigger like phishing botnet that have some parts on Windows or other platforms. Uh, so, uh, if the app is actually like interested in one-time passwords for banks or for other like logins, uh, with like such apps as Vision Tool. So yeah, and here um, the like major phishing techniques uh, divided into two buckets. One of them is for credential theft, and another for OTP theft. And we'll go in details uh, through all of these techniques. And we will start with JS injection. Uh, so these apps, uh, such apps, are uh, using actually they, they use actually legit web page for login. Uh, so in the screenshot you can see it's actually legit, um, legit uh, Instagram login page. Uh, but they injected uh, they injected malicious JavaScript into this web page. And um, in, 
in this case, uh, the JavaScript actually is doing two things. First of all, uh, you can see in upper part of the screenshot uh, the text. Make sure to use your Instagram username. Do not use Facebook for out. That's actually a part of malicious JavaScript because they want to be sure that the user will actually enter credentials and not use Facebook uh, for authentication. And the second thing that, the second malicious thing uh, that JavaScript is doing, uh, it extracts a password and username and sends them back uh, to the app through JavaScript interface. Uh, so, the perfect place uh, for such apps to inject uh, JavaScript is on page finished callback. Uh, so that callback will be called whenever the page loaded in web view is being fully loaded. Uh, and uh, yeah, they can call load URL to inject JavaScript and then send them back to JavaScript interface. So in this, uh, in this example, uh, we can see in the code that the app injected JavaScript and sent them back uh, and sent password and username back to the app. And uh, in the line like uh, set p word, uh, you can see that it actually saves uh, this string into shared preferences. So shared preferences, it's a local XML file. So the app is not sending, at least at this point, the app is not sending uh, credentials out of the device to some third party service. So if we see only these things happening with the password, we won't flag it as uh, efficient. But let's check other things that the app can do. Uh, as a next step, from should a write uh, URL loaded callback, the app will try to extract cookies, uh, especially if it's interested in this user ID and CSRF token. Uh, so by obtaining uh, these two cookies, uh, the app is actually capable to manipulate with the account. Uh, so they don't even need uh, uh, credentials. So whenever we see an app trying to extract cookies, uh, especially CRSF, CSRF token, and like other tokens, uh, we flag this app sufficient if, if the app extracts these tokens and uploads it somewhere. So um, in this case, uh, the app will combine these cookies into one, uh, string called user information. And in the second part of the screen, you can see that it actually puts uh, user information and all these uh, tokens. And then like a few lines under that, you can see that your name and P word is something extracted from shared preferences uh, being sent in the same request too. So the app actually like, trying to upload as much information as possible to the third party server, uh, third party for like Instagram. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's typical fishing. So, um, but even if the app won't do anything with credentials, it's still uh, enough, they, they're still doing enough badness to be flagged as fishing because they're still in, creden or they're still in cookies, especially like token that allows them to manipulate with the account. So they actually, uh, don't need the password because you know uh, yeah so that's it for js injection and cookie theft and fishing windows i like this example a lot because of the typer that they did uh, so uh, and I hope that because of this type typer they weren't able to steal uh most of credentials. Uh, so yeah, uh, that, that's actually great when they make these mistakes and yeah, that's a perfect example. Uh, so in this case, uh, it was an app, uh, it, it was actually a game. And after some time delay, if I remember correctly, it was like 24 hours, but it may be like even more, uh, it popped out this fission activity. So it's not even URL, they uh, created it like, as a native Android activity. Um, yeah, to steal credentials. And, uh, but you know, they popped out it like out of nowhere, just 24 hours later after the user uh, initially launched the app. 
So for the user, it may look somehow like uh, suspicious. So suddenly you see a request to sync in uh, from Google, which is weird. So some of this app that I actually think uh, trying better to look user into providing their credentials, they track for foreground app. So we discuss the techniques during ransomware techniques, so uh, ransomware training. They may use Activity Manager, Usage Stat Manager, Manager or Accessibility API to track the foreground app. And whenever uh, the target app is in foreground, for example, it can be like social media app, bank app, it can be like Google Play app, they will show the phishing window over this app. And uh, as we discussed during ransomware training, they may abuse system alert window uh, permission to create like some kind of sticky, sticky views, sticky windows. So the user won't, it, it will be really hard for the user to get rid of this, uh, get rid of this message. Uh, so in this example, uh, we can see that the app is actually abusing system alert window permission. So on the background, you can see uh, the original Google Play app and in the foreground, uh, it's the official window that looks pretty similar to the app. So yeah, it's, it's a great technique for phishing apps to do. And if it's done correctly, it looks uh, pretty legit on the device. And another technique that Personally, I like a lot from a technical point of view. Um, it was really interesting to investigate it. And it surprised me that there are almost no real fission apps that using this technique. So a little bit of ground. Uh, five years ago, um, security researchers found a vulnerability in a task um, stack for Android activities. And later, uh, I think last year, uh, another security researchers, they discovered some kind of uh, extension for this vulnerability. Uh, they call it StrengthHawk. You can read more information uh, by these links. I provided some links. So in general, work like that, the malware need to um, like check if target app, so the, the malware needs to target some specific installed apps. So it can uh, target any app. They have, they have to have like a list of package names for some specific apps they want to target. And then, uh, and then need to do some preparation. So, and by exploiting this vulnerability, uh, malware can redirect large attempts to its own app. Uh, let me show how it works. Uh, so there are actually like several different ways to use this technique for malicious purpose. Uh, that's the only one that I found in malware, in like real life malware. Um, so, and that's probably the easiest way to exploit this vulnerability. So uh, in the Android manifest, the app uh, need to um, declare one of its activities. So in this case, it will be uh, the line uh, with name Android name cm.app.wiredoms.getting. So it's, that's the class name from the malicious app. And the next line, Android task affinity, com.gettinggroup.mobilebanking app. It mentions the real banking app, the real, uh, yeah, the real app. So, and by uh, setting this task affinity uh, for malicious activity with that real legit app, uh, they somehow like bind them together. And uh, they also uh, set allow task uh, reparenting to true. Um, that's like important thing. So after that, uh, so that's, that's something that, um, mentioned in the manifest of a malware. After that, the only thing that malware needs to do, it's to start uh, that specific malicious activity before 
the banking app will be started. And it needs to start with flags, flag activity new tasks. So this activity won't be kind of binded with the malicious app, but it will be binded with the banking app. So uh, if on create callback from this activity is empty, the user won't actually see like anything, uh, but uh, the next step, when the user will go uh, to the original banking app and will start to, and will launch it, uh, the user will actually see that phishing activity because it's been set like to be the first uh, in, like uh, task stack for that specific activity. So that's that's really scary uh, technique, and it's so easy for phishing app to do that. So I I still have no idea why uh, no like almost no phishing apps are doing that. It's really hard to find uh, like real real app that is capable to do that. I don't know why, so, but it's like, it's so easy and it's so powerful, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, another very powerful techniques uh, been commonly abused by fishing apps, uh, it's accessibility. So, yeah, we discussed it during uh, accessibility abuse um, training, so a few highlights. Uh, the app needs to declare and implement accessibility service. Uh, all accessibility events will be sent to the own accessibility event callback and to extract uh, text from, from other apps, UI, from bank apps, UI, or like social media apps. Uh, the app needs to call get text, and yeah, that's basically it. Um, some apps may also try to like click on banking apps to perform uh, like fraudulent transactions uh, by by abusing its ability. So another way um, to make like credential theft uh, is to redirect outgoing calls. So we saw some malicious apps abusing. Uh, Business these techniques. So they need to declare process outgoing calls. This um, permission like considered as a dangerous permission uh, and you can see um, the dialogue of granting uh, this permission to, um, uh, to the app, it's a right screenshot. But it was depreciated in Android 10 and uh, in Android 10 um, apps can't use it anymore but they can use call redirection service to redirect calls. Uh, the thing is about call redirection service is that it's something like accessibility service and other very dangerous like features. So the app will need to ask user to go through settings app and like specifically enable this feature for an app and so on. Uh, so it probably will, uh, will be not the easiest way for the user to do. And another thing that it was introduced only in Android 10, and that's, that's probably why we haven't seen any malware abusing it. Uh, I was able to find only like malicious apps with process outgoing calls, permission to redirect calls. And it actually works pretty easy, it's surprisingly easy. So the app need to register a receiver for new outgoing call action and uh, on receive callback will be triggered every time the user is trying to call some number. Uh, so the number that user is trying to call, the app can get through get result data call. And for example, if it's a bank number, uh, the app can enable redirection uh, by calling set result data and to some number. And that's, yeah, that's like, that, that will happen invisible to the user. And um, that's, I think that's pretty powerful technique. So whenever the user is trying to call uh, their bank, they will be actually directed to uh, criminals and they will be able to get like, credentials or anything else they want because you know, the user is sure that they, they are calling uh, like legit number, so yeah. Uh, so this, are all for um, credential theft techniques. Um, if you have any questions about that, uh, you can ask them before I will go to uh, OTP theft. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, let's go to OTP theft. Um, so the easiest way, uh, so the most common way, uh, the, the most common technique banks use to deliver uh, one-time passwords to the users is obviously SMS. So um, the easiest way for malicious app to steal SMS is to use uh, SMS message API. Uh, to intercept and common SMS. So the app needs to declare receive SMS uh, permission and it needs to declare receiver for SMS received intent. So also if the app wants to delete this incoming SMS, it needs to be set as a default SMS on the device. Uh, so yeah, interesting code will be triggered from on receive callback. And yeah, here you can see uh, the snippet from code snippet from uh, Android manifest for SMS received uh, receiver. And uh, on the right, you can see a screenshot. Uh, so receive SMS considered uh, as a dangerous permission. So the user, so it's not enough for an app to just declare it. The app need to ask the user to grant, to, to allow the app to read SMS. Um, yeah, but Another thing about this like receive SMS permission that we actually have uh, some policies on play that uh, like, do not allow any app declare receive SMS permission. So it's not an easy ask, uh, it, it's not an easy task for them to sneak such app to the uh, play. And they found a way to bypass uh, this thing. So apps can abuse status bar notification API to access status bar notifications from different apps. And that's like, um, so whenever default SMS app or like email app receives a receive new message, they usually generate some notification, status bar notification. And the app that is capable to use status bar notification API, it can actually read uh, this notification, extract text, and it also can like, hide this notification. So, of course, the app want to have a uh, possibility to delete incoming SMS and incoming um, email, but at least it will be able to hide the notification and maybe the user won't like find out it for some time that uh, the fraudulent uh, uh, tr transaction being done. Um, yeah, to use this um, API, um, the app needs to implement, declare and implement notification listening server uh, service. Uh, you can see an uh, example of, uh, um, of Android manifest. So the app needs to uh, implement a service for intent uh, Android service notification notification listener service with bind notification listener service permission, and um, it also need to create a class with uh, on notification posted callback and uh, on notification posted callback will be triggered for every new notification like status bar notification. Uh, and yeah, again, it's considered like a dangerous feature, so the user will have to grant access to the app through like settings app uh, with like, some additional information about this. Okay, um, and another, another way to uh, steal OTPs uh, is to enable call forwarding. So um, malicious app can enable call forwarding through USSD request. So USSD request is not uh, some kind of Android API or Android feature. It's uh, uh, it's some it's some command that can be executed on carrier mobile carrier side. Uh, so to like trigger this command, the app uh, or the user, if they want to do it by themselves, they need to like call specific number, uh, like, uh, like actually like execute specific command through the phone. Uh, through, uh, 
through the phone app. So to do that, an app need to declare call phone permission uh, and it's considered to be a dangerous permission. So the, user, uh, the app will have to ask user in runtime to grant access to this uh, permission. And uh, how it works, so uh, different mobile carriers may have different commands to enable call forwarding. Um, and all calls will be actually forwarded. So it will forward all incoming calls. Um, you know, some banks actually send in one-time passwords through calls, or there is like an option to send uh, one-time passwords through calls. So um, like malicious app can actually enable uh, call forwarding uh, before they will trigger this uh, type of OTP uh, like delivering. And then they will have to like disable it uh, because otherwise all calls from this phone will be forwarded to the malicious number. Uh, and another thing that uh, such request will be visible to the user. So there are not a real way to hide it from the user. So uh, malicious apps are trying to overlay um, call phone, uh, uh, phone app UI with their own malicious UI, was it trying to lock the phone or like somehow somehow hide it? Yep. So yeah, that's it for techniques. And here are some examples. So yeah, we have actually tons of examples, like many other different apps. Um, yeah, let's. If you have any questions before we will go to the decompiler, you can ask them right now. Okay, let's check um, some of these behaviors in the compiler and we will start with um, SMS, with OTP theft through SMS. Um, let's check do it manifest. And here we can see that the app uh, declares permissions to receive SMS. And also it uh, declares receiver for SMS received intent. So that's the place where we need to go. Um, let's check it. Com. Receivers in common SMS. Here is it. So every new uh, SMS will be sent to this on receive callback because uh, the class actually extends the broadcast receiver class. Uh, so what's happening here, what's important for us, uh, that, so th this line, so it creates like SMS message, then instructs uh, display original originating address and display message body. So display message body will be like the actual message body, right? Uh, and they send this, uh, well, let's do update message. Okay, let's go to update message. Here it is. Let's check what happening with this. And this thing will be sent to message. So yeah. So um that's that's some so they don't uh, this app uh doesn't use regular like c2 instead they use a uh, firebase database it's like cloud-based real-time database and they upload this sms into this database so that's actually something that uh kind of clever move because uh, security researchers won't see any like suspicious domain, suspicious C2 in network communication. Actually, the app is used like Firebase, many other apps. And uh, yeah, they can simply extract uh, these like, messages from the database. So uh, to store um, this value in, in the database, they need to call set value. So they call set value for this message model. So is it like that? Just actually like a few lines of code to still come in SMS. 
Yeah. So another interesting technique that I wanted to cover is this. Um, so this app, uh, if we go to to the manifest, we actually won't see any interesting permissions except for that. But they actually don't have to declare the permission. So I think then they just didn't spend enough time reading manual for that. But yeah, okay. So that's not regular permission. The, it, um, it doesn't matter if they defined it here or not. Uh, so the interesting part for us, so something's happening, but uh, nothing really suspicious. Uh, here it is. So the app actually declares some service for Android service notification, notification uh, listener service. Uh, it means that this class uh, will receive every new status bar notification. So we can go directly to that class or we can search for, that's, that's the way I'm usually doing when, when I'm analyzing notification, uh, status bar notification abuse. We can go to on notification. Okay. So that's a callback that will be called um, for every new status bar notification. And so the thing is that uh, this class, uh, notification listener class, you need to extend notification listener service. And it means that they even if they use obfuscation or something like that, they can't rename this method. It should still have the same name on notification post. And it doesn't matter uh, what the kind of obfuscation they use. It still be called on notification posted and uh, yeah, all the things will happen here. Um, so here's uh, status bar notification. So they extract package name from the status bar notification. So uh, whenever, the device generates new status bar notification, they will actually be able to see which actual package generated this notification and they will be able to extract text from this notification. So in this example, um, if the package name doesn't contain Android or system UI, they will try to extract text and upload it to the CPU. And yeah, so and if this notification was from email, from like from the package name that contains mail, they will cancel this notification. By cancel they, they will just hide it, like remove it from the status bar. Um, other than that, if that's not true they anyway will try to get all lines and upload it uh, to the c2 and if um, the package name contains messaging they will cancel this notification too so from this part it's pretty obvious that the app is actually trying to steal all messages like all messages and emails uh, by relying on the package name that generated this event. Uh, so yeah, they're probably interested in like SMS and different OTPs. Okay, yeah, let's go to task hijacking. Um, I really like this example. So uh, that's a phishing app that like, exploiting task hijacking uh, vulnerability, uh, like problem, something like that. Uh, it will go through permissions. We actually find lots of scary permissions and they actually have many different places where we would like to analyze it, start analyzing it. For example, it like, uh, it uses device admin, right? And yeah, everything like that. So there are many places where we want to analyze it. and. Um, I think that first time when I, when I analyzed this app, I actually missed all these lines because there's so many interesting things happening here, right? Like SMS receivers, device admin receiver, all this kind of stuff. So, but 
right now we're interested in this part. So these lines are actually related to task hijacking. And let me show you this. So they have a list of like malicious class names from the app. And they have different task affinity, like, ta like different task affinity packages for them. Uh, and all of these packages are actually legit bank names. So they are targeting all of these apps. And yeah, so task affinity, allow task reparenting, and so on. So let's go to any of them. Let's go to the first one. And this will be it's somehow. So what was that? BHP. Yep, here it is. Uh, so whenever the app, whenever this activity will be created, uh, on create call, uh, on create callback will be called, but it's actually like not really anything interesting going here um so let's search for the place where this class is used so yeah quickly i'm interested yep this so this my service uh whenever it will start it will start all these activities with these flags so this flags means start new task for every of these um uh, like so actually yeah so it's for specific intent uh yeah so uh anyway it will start these activities for this specific class. And if we we'll go back to this uh, class. So I showed you that on create callback is actually empty because the first time the activity started, it, it's been started by the malicious app and they don't want you to show anything bad at this point of view. They want you to show malicious code whenever uh, the, the legit banking app is being executed. So that's why all malicious code actually happening in on resume callback. So it will be called when this activity will be like resumed. And yeah, it checked for the internet. And if it has internet, uh, it will actually create this web view and load URL uh, like from local file. And it also implements, uh, yeah, on this on JS alert callback. So the callback from this file, oh, so, so the JS file from this HTML file will be able to send some data back on this JS, back, back to this code, back to this on JS alert. And it will actually upload data that was sent to it into the malicious URL. So we can actually go and check this malicious HTML function here uh, and here it is so let's that so I'm interested in Uh, here it is. So uh, they actually will like call alert uh, method uh, uh, from JavaScript with all like stolen data, and it will be sent back to the Java code, uh, which will upload all this data to the server. So yeah, that's it. And yeah, let's. Check install JS, for example. 
So this app it will go to the Android manifest. It's actually, yeah, it doesn't have any malicious permissions, permissions, uh, perm permissions, uh, like nothing really suspicious except for uh, this like com instant pulse login activity and so on. So let's go and check what's happening this login activity. Um, instant followers. Analytics. Oh, login activity. Here it is. So Um, yeah, login dialog, uh, the app actually like loads legit uh, Instagram phishing page or in Instagram login page. Um, yeah. So, and uh, here's a web view client for that. So from on page finished callback, they will load this JavaScript. Uh, so the important thing about this JavaScript that they will get password from from the page and send it back to Android set keyword method. Uh, so Android, in this case, Android is JavaScript interface and we need to search for the place where it sets Android. It is. So the app actually sets JavaScript for like called Android. Let's go to this JavaScript and it actually has set keyword that will save keyword in shared preferences. So yeah, we can actually search for this method. Oh, for the string to find out if it will try to assess it later. Yeah. Yep, here it is. Uh, so then in some other place, it tries to upload this username and password. Uh, from the shared pair references to their like, web server. Uh, so for this user information, let's search for usage. Uh, and it should be here. So yeah, from, uh, it, it, it will be set from get cookies. Let's search for, wait. Usage, here it is. Uh, so from should I rely, uh, should I write URL loading callback, uh, it will call get cookies uh, with cookies and cookies it's actually like uh, cookies from the cookie manager. And they specifically uh, check if this user ID and uh, CRF token is already set. So yeah, and all of this like, bad behavior is happening actually in the same class. So you don't need to like analyze anything else in the app. It's just enough to go to the class where the like, third party app is trying to use some suspicious like, URLs for login. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it for example. So we have some examples left. So we went through this, uh, went through, this stream. So other examples, uh, yeah, it would be great if you have some time and review them. So yeah, that's it from my side. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Roman. This is great. Again, you know, I think you've got a nice formula for uh, going through a number of APKs uh, and showing us how you're analyzing them. I think this is very valuable for all of us. Uh, questions from uh, the audience? All right, so I think uh, as I hypothesize, you know, um, late in the evening, East Coast time, 
um, uh, I, I suspect uh, people are getting a little wiped out. So we're going to do the following. I think uh, we have the uh, lab session now. And Sebastian, uh, you guys have sent out some um, samples uh, from uh, different categories, uh, right. including, um, ransomware, uh, phishing, etc. So how would people to play with those? Uh, are you suggesting we download, um, you know, uh, Android Studio and uh, work through that, or what, what? What is the sort of recommended plan of action? I think the easiest would be to uh, use ChatX, kind of like um, Roman has been doing it for his uh, hands-on uh, part of the uh, his his, his uh, sessions. Uh, and then I would just say for the phishing samples, I just posted the link in chat. Try to find how the phishing actually happens for the ransomware yeah. sample. Try to find out where the uh, the, the ransom is being uh, asked uh, for, and also what is maybe the uh, the uh, method that uh, a certain piece of ransomware is employing? Is it um, encrypting data? Is it denying access to the device? Is it changing uh, the, the device password or anything like that? And yep. um, Android Studio is actually nice because you get the emulator with Android Studio. So you could actually push the, uh, the applications onto the Android emulator that comes with Android Studio. So it's definitely also very interesting to play around uh, with. In particular, I think for ransomware, where the behavior is maybe easier to trigger than for phishing, where certain certain um, other conditions mm -hmm. have to be met. Um, but I'm around. If you have any, sam any any questions about samples, um, other people it, are around, so we can just actually talk it through. So I saw a bunch of questions earlier um, on the chat, which has have already been answered by uh, from Chan, for example. So. You know, just to ask Chan as he's here, um, you said you've already downloaded JADX, is that correct? Yep, uh, I have already installed that and on my machine. Uh, it worked, it worked as, 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 as so, yeah. As no, no. Show. But um, I think the question uh, to you, as well as to some of the other people on the call, is are you guys, uh, as we have these samples and we have all these, you know, world experts. Um, on the call, um, have some of you down? You know, have some of the others downloaded JADX and are playing around with some of the samples posted uh, through links on the chat? Because I think if you do that now, then I think you can get you know some good opportunities to ask questions as you go through them. Maybe share your screens with uh, some of the folks from Google who are here who can provide some advice. You mean for me or for other? Uh, anyone on the call, really. Okay. So the only one I know for sure has downloaded JADX as you. So I don't know yeah. if the others have already. So, but if not, please do so. Yeah. Uh, I can share my screen and yeah. uh, because I I just use the link and I just got JADX and just got the. And can you see my screen? Just like something like this, and I just. Yeah, yeah, I can see your screen. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, you can see we just, oh, sorry. What happened? It just crashed. <laughs> uh, because I mean, it's, I'm not sure what kind of system or operating system are you using, but for Mac OS, it's very simple. Uh, for me, I just go to the link I attach there and just use the brew install, uh, JetX. And then just using the simple, how to say? Yeah, it's not here. Can you see my screen again? Yeah. Uh, just just use, I mean, some some instructions in, in the to, in, in the uh, from the link, and I just got this. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's back there again. Mm. Let me do it again. And the command is also very simple. I mean, if we do not use use this one, the dash with GUI, and uh, just it just gives you the, I mean, the total decompile uh, de decompiled files, the file folder. Mm -hmm. But if you just attach the dash GUI, and then it can just launch the interface.
oops, I think it's not stable. Maybe I should try another version maybe. But just, I mean, if we do not use the this one without the dash GUI, uh, you can see it's trying, it's, it's, it's loading and then it, all the decompile, decompiled folders are there. You can see here uh, for the ransomware, yeah, this one, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, uh, we can use other kind of, I mean, the code editor. Maybe for me, I prefer to use a sublime, so like this. So you can just, just, I mean, put it here and you can just try to find the source code as, as we saw, something like this. I mean, this is at least very stable, but maybe some other guys have other, I mean, I mean the performance can be better than my machine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm using uh, JEDEX uh, on Linux, and yeah, unstable version uh, works kind of fine there. Um, I never tried it to run on mm -hmm. Mac OS. So the, uh, the great thing about like JEDEX GUI that you can actually find usage and uh, yeah, you can jump to definition of the class or find the usage of the variable or like yeah so it's also a open source that means uh, if you want to fix the crash you can make a code contribution <laughs> <laughs> John, are we still seeing your screen? Uh, I, I can just, I mean, stop yeah. sharing. But now, I mean, from from the other screen, I, it, it it doesn't crash. But just, I mean, I drag it from the other screen, from another screen, and just crashed. You're weird. <laughs> uh, you can see on this screen. Uh, can you see this screen? Uh, this, yes. I mean, like like the Roman shows. something yeah I think it works for me right it, you can see your screen Perfect. I think the um, John um, and others um, Roman went through the um, you know the Chi Hu example and showed us how he analyzed it but I think there were a couple of other samples uh, from the set of five or six that were sent to us which he may not have gone through. So maybe the idea should be to go through some of those and see um, you know, how we might analyze them using some of the things we've learned this afternoon. Perfect. So, um, so if you look at, you know, uh, you want to open one of the other samples? Uh, for, did you download the? Um, yep, yep. The, I can. You know, let's say ransomware as that's. Yeah, let's say something like this. Okay. So can you, can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Perfect. So, I mean, just, you can see, we just go to the ransom folder because I mean, we have several samples here. You can see maybe we just use the pass uh, APK. Sure. So we just, yeah, I don't recall going through that for very long. I think yeah. it was mentioned briefly by uh, Roman, but not in as much depth. Just use the simple, I mean, from the very beginning, I mean, if we, uh, let me show from the very beginning. So maybe, the, Hold a second. Uh, the, the link, the link here, I have attached in the chat chat box, so I guess people can go there and find this library. Uh, you can see this here main library, and I just, I mean, here for Linux and for Mac OS, I just use this one. But maybe it's not available for Windows right now, I guess. But just at least for Linux and Mac OS, I guess it works. Yeah. Uh, I just use this command. Uh, you go to your com command, 
terminal and I just uh, pass it there, paste it there and just take maybe two to three minutes and just, it works. Maybe, I mean, maybe <clears throat> it asks you to, to do something else. So let, maybe let me show it again, because I mean, currently I just use it in, I mean, in this specific Python environment, maybe I can just uh, switch to another Python environment and, and try it again. Uh, I actually downloaded it from the download part. And uh, I think that uh, when you download it from there, you, you actually have uh, dot .bat script for Windows. Um, and, um, I was actually suggesting something else, okay? Mm -hmm. um, which is different from what you're doing. You've already installed, you know, I agree, a somewhat unstable version of JADX, it seems. But what I'm saying is, suppose we were looking at the APK, the PES.APK. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know from the presentation that uh, uh, Roman gave that it's a piece of ransomware. But for a minute, forget about that, okay? Mm -hmm. we don't. And so what are the steps we would go through to sort of say, okay, you know, here's the smoking gun, which shows that this is ransomware. Or we might not know it's ransomware. We might just think it's something else. And we want to see whether it's doing anything funny. So if we want to start and say, okay, you know, we're looking, um, to see if it's ransomware, you know, the question I have for uh, Roman and uh, Sebastian and the Google folks is, um, you know, I would start by looking, I mean, is it correct that the way you would do this is to start by looking and searching on JADX for certain kinds of permissions like bind device admin, force lock, et cetera, which is kind of the way I think, um, uh, Roman walked us through read or write external storage, etc. Is that consistent with what you know? Am I, is my understanding consistent with what your practice would be when you do use these tools? Yep. Okay. So so go ahead, Roman. Uh, but based on like uh, suspicious uh, permissions or something like that. Will go so mostly based on signals from from the manifest. Uh, we need to check if it's like being abused, being uh, used for some malicious purpose or not. So, uh, yeah. So, basically, well, ransomware in particular, um, ransomware is not very subtle, right? It's, yeah. it's very in your face, and so if you actually get the application to run, you'll probably see that it's ransomware uh, because the ransom node pops up. Um, for what it's worth, there are very unique strings which are about Bitcoin or about payments or about mm -hmm. ransom or whatever. Um, so if you just look through the strings, then um, it's also very easy to uh, just realize that. Um, so I would say actually recognizing that you're dealing with ransomware on a manual level is fairly straightforward. Yeah. No, again, I'm, I'm not looking at ransomware in particular, Sebastian. Saying if you've got a sample and you suspect there's something off with it, then, you know, what procedure do you guys, you, do you recommend? Right. I mean, to me, from what I've seen today is obviously in the cases that Roman has presented today, he knew what they were. He didn't have a brand new sample that he was looking at that he'd never seen before. But presumably that's what you do day in and day out, right? You have brand new samples that are flagged uh, as being suspicious for some reason by perhaps an ML piece of code. You look at it and you say, okay, you know, this is right, this is wrong. Is that correct? Um, in general, in general, what I do is, um, well, it depends a little bit because I think if you work at Google and you have all the tools available that we have at Google, right. the way you go at it is very different than right. 
the way you go at it with uh, publicly available tools, I would say. Um, <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> yeah, and so we have a lot of very powerful scanners which actually kind of point you in the right direction of what you should look at. Yeah. But yeah. if I had to do it with the, with the tools that we're using in this class here, I would try to familiarize myself a little bit with the, uh, with the manifest file first. Because yeah. the manifest yeah. file gives you important information about, oh, what are the permissions, what right. are the services that are there, activities, anything that's unusual, right? Um, then I would try strings next. Uh, I would try to understand what, what big package names exist out there and so on. So my very first idea is just try to get an overview of, of what right. the application could actually be about. So form a mental image of, of what you think the application is about. And then once you've formed a mental image, maybe you say, oh, that's a game probably then, then uh, try to look for things that are kind of odd for a game. Like, why would a game need the read contact list permission, right? It's an odd right. thing. So kind of dive into these oddities um, until you kind of complete your mental image where you say, it seems odd, but it's legitimate, or it seems odd, and there's definitely something wrong with it. And so kind of, kind of step for step, build a, build, build a mental image of, of what you're actually expect and then compare your expectations with what you actually see in the code. Okay. That's my technique. Many, many reverse engineers have very different techniques. No, but I think that makes sense. So basically what you're saying is look at the manifest, see what kinds of permissions and so forth are being uh, uh, requested there <laughs> and then go look and see how those permissions are being used uh, in the rest of the code by searching for it. Okay, and then in some sense, uh, this allows you to build up this mental model of yeah. what this uh, piece of code does. All right, so, you know, I'm thinking uh, there's pretty uh, solid silence from people. So what I would suggest is rather than try to go on till 7 p.m., uh, unless people want to, which is fine, what I suggest is that people try and download uh, JADX and play around with some of these samples tonight. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Or tomorrow morning, you yeah. mm -hmm. Come on. Great. So I see a few more faces coming up. So Zdenek. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that, yeah, I also downloaded JDEX. It works. Uh, for some reason, the, the regular version didn't decompile some of the examples that Roman was showing, like, uh, um, the the on on notification example in the in one of them but but the um yeah on, on notification posted in the last or one of the last examples but the unstable version seems to work okay i don't know what that was maybe some some glitch but yeah it works on windows it's great great so um okay so it sounds like um Maybe what people should do is to play around with JADX and some of the pieces of um, some of the APKs that uh, you guys have shipped us. And, you know, maybe the time to ask questions is tomorrow in the, in the lab tomorrow when we've had a day to, when everybody's had a day to play around with this. Does that make sense to people? Uh, I don't mean Sebastian, but to the students and uh, postdocs and so forth on the call from Berkeley. There's also lunch break tomorrow that we can discuss it a little bit. So. Oh, there is lunch break too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, I want you guys to have lunch. Tomorrow I plan to bring my lunch, so. Uh, so, all right, so excellent. So, yeah, so why don't we do that as a sort of homework plan for tomorrow, which is download JADX, go through some of the apps, and we'll go back to uh, and see if you can identify the places, as Sebastian said where something suspicious is going on. You know, where are they uh, locking the screen? Where are they, um, you know, uh, intercepting uh, SMSs or one-time passwords and so forth? You know, so I think if, so to some extent, those are the smoking guns, right? Um, in the code that say, okay, you know, regardless of what other tools and scanners might say, this is sort of the concrete evidence that this piece of code is doing something malicious. 
So I would say everybody should play around with that, the Dartmouth folks anyway, overnight and come back tomorrow and maybe over lunchtime tomorrow, which lunchtime, California time is 3 p.m. here, the, the lunch, the break we have. Uh, maybe we can um, go over some of these examples tomorrow afternoon. Make sense? Sure, definitely. All right. Uh, I'm looking for the other Dartmouth students here, Samid and Prashant and- uh, Yeah, yeah. Sound good to you, Prashant? Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, I just have a quick question for the Google Show. Okay, this so, is the time to ask questions, so feel free. Yeah, so uh, I was playing around with JEDEX uh, for a while now, and the challenge over here is that there are, uh, like these, uh, the source code has a, a bunch of packages, and each package has a bunch of files. And uh, without any, I mean, obviously, when you look at the manifest file, it tells you that these permissions th this particular app is using, but without any sort of an indication that this is exactly where I need to go and look. Uh, how, like, so you, you describe that in, uh, like internally inside Google, you use a bunch of tools. So could you give us an intuition as to what these tools do? Sorry, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Uh, is it, um, are you asking, how can you find out how certain permissions are used in an application? Um, no. So, uh, I mean, I, I sort of understand what VS was saying some time back, which is that you start with the manifest file and then you look through the source code and see uh, which package is using which permission in what way. And that seems like a, a, a lot more manual process. And uh, uh, But you also mentioned that internally inside Google, you have access to a lot more tools that automates this process. Could you right. give us an intuition as to what these tools are and what they do? I understand that not all of them might be open source, but could you right. give us an intuition as to what these tools do? Because uh, this particular process seems a lot manual. Right. Um, so basically what happens for, for every application that is uploaded to Google Play, not just that, also for every application that we get from other sources, so we do very standard uh, static analysis, um, like uh, uh, data flow analysis of sensitive data, for example, if uh, code analysis tries to find any kind of exfiltration attempts of, let's say, your contact list, your SMS messages, stuff like that. Any kind of suspicious behaviors, like, for example, an application installation happening when the, the phone screen is, is off, um, like, the, like nobody's using the phone. Um, so we do a lot of static analysis to kind of points you in the right direction of just very suspicious code snippets. We also do um, dynamic analysis. So every application is executed for a couple of minutes um, using a fairly smart way to generate clicks across an application. And so we actually, we instrument, don't instrument a lot. I, think, I don't think you never instrument a lot of code in, in a couple of minutes, but you instrument, you instrument enough code in, in an emulator, which, uh, actually helps us find a lot of stuff because it's, it's in particular for malware, for actual malware, um, they tend to want to go at their goal very fast. And so even if you just get a couple of clicks into an application, you very often can just um, trigger that malicious behavior and then you have a log of it and it points you in the right direction. Um, so those are the basics. And after the basics, we have a whole bunch of stuff like uh, machine learning, which says, hey, we believe it's spyware because of uh, this feature and this feature and this feature. And so we actually, we have a ranked feature list for these spyware results um, that we have said, we believe uh, we, have, we have machine learning results to say, hey, this belongs to a category of malware, let's say spyware or Trojan or any of those that I presented in the first talk today. We also have machine learning algorithms that say, hey, um, this belongs to a certain malware family because of this feature and this feature and this feature. And so I think a lot of the, a lot of these machine learning algorithms, not just those are really all about helping you construct a mental image of what's going on. So when a machine, yeah. uh, when, when machine learning tells you, this is likely 80% um, spyware because of the following things, you, you tend to look at the things, right? That they suggest as features that are highly contributing to the score and you just, look at it and then you look at the first feature with the highest score and you say, yeah, 
this is definitely this is definitely a, a harmful. Then you look at the second one, and maybe you realize this is an, an, a completely harmless SDK that's also used. So then you mentally subtract the, the score of that feature from the overall score, and then you reassess: does is machine learning still telling you it's valuable or not? So put on the feature list. And in addition to static dynamic and features. Um, Sorry, machine learning, we have a lot of other things. We have um, a code similarity-based clustering, for example. Um, we have um, we have it for both, for native code and, and for, for Java code. Um, we have the ability to, uh, to, un to, to run uh, applications uh, simulated in different locales to get around scans um, for Google IP addresses, or we have get around um, uh, scans that require a certain country, for example, maybe the bad code is only uh, executed in Russia or Vietnam and so on. Uh, we get a lot of telemetry data from actual devices. So we don't, we, we actually, we, um, we, we log on, on devices. Um, for example, what do we log? Permission usage, right? So if, we, if an application uses certain permissions, we just ping that back and say this application, we have proof from a real device that it uses sent SMS. And, so if we if we can't find it in the in the in the code where they use send SMS, it just means they're hiding it better. Um, a lot of a lot of developers are, are really just um, just declaring permissions that they never use for various reasons. And so you're never quite sure, but just by looking at an application, if they're really not using it or if they're just hiding it well enough that you don't see it. But if you have the telemetry from real life devices, they if, we, if, if an application has 10,000 installs worldwide and we see uh, on uh, 2,500 of those that you send SMS, then we have a perfect proof essentially and we can keep looking. And so between the telemetry and uh, the actual application scanner, that just helps us um, to form a picture, not just of what a code is like, but what a confirmed behavior from real devices is like. And so all these systems contribute a little bit and then at the end you come up with a, with a fairly big image of um, what's actually going on. I really think that's actually the key that no, none, of the, none of the technologies that we have, I think is particularly advanced and uh, sorry for uh, kind of uh, throwing our software engineers under the bus a little bit, but uh, I think it's really the integration of the different systems and looking at certain behaviors from many different angles is really the key to what we have. So a standalone product like ChatX, which of course is only be de developed by one or two people, I don't know. Any, any product which does not have this very widely available cross integration with different systems is gonna be less powerful. Even if maybe the static analysis is much better or the dynamic analysis is much better. If they don't have these many different systems to collect the data, then I think um, you're gonna be in a worse spot. So I think that's very helpful to know, Sebastian. So basically what you're saying is that um, your confidence in what the system, in your impression or mental image of a piece of, of an app is shaped by a number of different ways of looking at that app. Right. Uh, and each of those ways may have one or more tools associated with it. And it's sort of the totality of these things that shapes your impression of what's going on. Right, I really think it's important because no matter what you do, dynamic analysis, yeah. static analysis, machine learning, all of these techniques have their limitations, right? Right. And um, at one point, you're just gonna hit the point of diminishing returns. And no matter how much you push, you will eventually get to the point where it gets really, really hard to improve static code analysis. Um, so why push for it harder when you could just use an alternative source Mm -hmm, certain mm -hmm. information is maybe available in a much easier way. Right. And then other information is available in a much harder way. And then you combine those different sources and then you have like 10, 15 different sources of information. Um, but none of them have to be like super advanced. Um, so I don't think we're gonna, I don't think internally we are, maybe I completely mischaracterized and misrepresent our software engineering work here. I think none of the, none of the tools that we have are, are pushing the cutting edge of program analysis. But the integration of the different systems is so powerful that I find it difficult to imagine that anybody else in the world has that kind of powerful Android app analysis setup. Yeah, well, 
sounds I that sounds compelling to me. So all right, more questions from anyone else? Um so like if you use uh Gira or uh uh I forget the other other tool. Uh like uh yeah. So if you use Gira for example, like it does give you a control flow graph for the uh, for for any binary. Um, is there any such tool for Android that can give you the control flow graph across all the intents and services? Somebody uh, using Jep or yeah, yeah, Jep, something like that. Jep, something like that. Jep is a, like a thousand dollars per license or something like that, I think. But it's a great tool, um, I have to say. Um, we have a couple of licenses, um, and I know um, quite a few people on our team are actually using Jep. Uh, whenever our tools break down, essentially for some reason, we can't wait for our software engineers to fix it and push a new version uh, into production. So we're just gonna switch to Jep for now and uh, continue our investigation. Sure. It was really great, but it's also very privacy. I'm not aware of an open source tool which has similar functionality. Uh, Sebastian, I also have a question. Uh, I don't remember whether we mentioned that in today's tutorial, but I mean, for me, so to suppose, I mean, suppose that, I mean, we have the source code and the source code can be transferred to bytecode or native code to, I mean, to control the behavior of the APK. So is it possible that, I mean, so some of the behavior doesn't show in the source code, but the developer just, I mean, operates the native code and then to get some specific behavior to show some, I mean, to, to show some more behavior for the APK. So I guess that will be, I mean, much more advanced to, to be detected, right? When you say the developer has a functionality to upgrade the native code, what kind of technology do you have in mind for that? Like, how would that work? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just wondering if there's something existing there. So, I'm not sure. So, stepping back, there's a couple of ways back how I could imagine this works, right? For example, there's the possibility, and, um, and that's actually a real possibility that is happening in some sense, that maybe you as a malware author, you ship some kind of homemade virtual machine that is just in time compiled um, during, during uh, the application when it runs, right? And so if, if the code that you're shipping is actually in your own predefined bytecode language, we essentially we have no chance of analyzing that. And then maybe you, you ship a little bit of... Um, of um, a just-in-time compiler that takes the bytecode and compiles it to native code, right? That's one way to generate native code. Um, it is, there's a couple of different variations. You don't have to do a just-in-time compiler. You could also, for example, um, you can use a, a patch library, for example, and download a patch from the internet, apply that patch to your binary, and then execute that, right? Um, in, in general, this is, a, this is a concept that we call um, dynamic code loading. Um, dynamic code loading is, um, as, it, uh, as the name implies, you, you try to load some code which is not necessarily present at the time, or it's not necessarily present in the, in the application file that you're looking at. And that's a big pain for us. Um, it's a big pain because in particular for native code, you can essentially allocate some memory, you can write instructions into it, and then you can um, put the instruction point of your CPU to execute that memory buffer. And that's painful uh, for us to detect. At that point, and that's something we're actually pursuing, at that point, we need to talk to the platform security team and say, hey, we need to come up with restrictions that don't just allow any kind of random application to, uh, to allocate and execute arbitrary code in memory. Um, it's very problematic. And it is probably one of the most common ways that, uh, that malware authors actually use today to get around scanning and trying to delay discovery as much as possible. 
So it's a big problem. I don't have a good answer for how to solve it. Uh, besides, that's, that, that's very good to know. That's very good to know because I mean, I just know that maybe I'm not sure whether this is correct, but maybe do you think API reflection is one of this technique, kind of dynamic technique yeah. to avoid the static, I mean, code implemented in the source, but just, I mean, kind of, it can only be there during the dynamic analysis or dynamic runtime, right? Reflection definitely happens all the time. Um, there's one big difference actually between uh, Java code dynamic code loading, I uh, saw Java dynamic code loading and native code dynamic code loading. Java dynamic code loading ultimately has to go through a class loader. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to hook all Java code that is being executed um, because there's a well-defined API interface that your code has to go through. For native code, there's no such thing. As I said, you can just allocate memory right into it and then execute that, um, which is much, much harder to, to detect that it even happens in the first place, let alone acquire the, uh, the code. Perfect, perfect. Or maybe I just suppose that maybe in the future for Google Android security team, for maybe the designer for the, for the Android architecture, maybe if, I mean, for the common developers, never, people never want to, I, I just maybe, the quote, people never want to, I mean, just operate the native code directly. Maybe just some bad guy want to use some specific techniques to do some specific things. So maybe just in the future, just abandon this kind of specific part and just the, the things could be more safer, I guess. I, uh, I keep pushing for that. Um, it's complicated actually, um, because there are legitimate applications, in particular the big browsers who want to uh, uh, just in time compile JavaScript, uh, like Firefox, for example. Um, they need the functionality for legitimate purposes. Um, and on iOS, they don't have that functionality actually, which is why, um, why all the browser vendors always complain that on iPhone, you can't get alternative browsers. You can only get uh, the, um, the iOS uh, web rendering um, component, or the, the iOS web renderer. And you can, you can create your own skin, but you, you, you have to rely on iOS executing and rendering your web pages, um, which is different on Android. Uh, Firefox has its own rendering engine, and so have the other competing browsers. And, if we had a restriction that is as strict as the, the one on iOS, um, which is, I don't think, anything we would like to do, then uh, Firefox may have the same problem. They would have to switch to, let's say, the WebViewer slash Chrome rendering engine. Um, so there's definitely big, big uh, legitimate applications that use that functionality in a very legitimate and useful way. And we need to be careful that we don't uh, anger the developers of these uh, legitimate applications. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. So I think on that note, we'll sign off for the day. Uh, Sebastian and team, thank you all so much. And uh, we'll reconvene at 12 tomorrow and um, uh, our lunch break will be an informal discussion tomorrow. Uh, lunch break on the West Coast, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. on the East Coast will be an informal discussion of, you know, what people's experiences are as they go through the uh, 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 JEDEX uh, system and apply it to try analyze some of the samples that uh, Sebastian and Roman have shared this afternoon. So again, thanks everybody. Uh, stay safe and see you all tomorrow.